Hello and welcome to the 12th episode of Nations of Charlemagne, the Arise of the Habsburgs. Now, during the reign of Maximilian I, who is going to be the, the end point of this stream, um, he devised a wonderful motto. I'll spare you all the Latin, but um, this is how it reads in English. Let others wage wars, but you, happy Austria, shall marry. For those kingdoms which Mars gives to others, Venus gives to thee. Essentially, what I'm going to be chronicling throughout the stream is how, despite the fact the prospects of the House of Habsburg in the middle of the 14th century looked dire, if not moribund, and Germany was divided, war-torn, basically desolute, and um, lacking all sort of, you know, economic or sort of cultural prestige without Europe, much of the power of the empire had been now by this point substituted by France, albeit France is now declining as a result of the Hundred Years' War. What we see from 1356 until 1519 is the miraculous rise of the House of Habsburg through the policy of dynastic expansion through marriage. And from the humble beginnings of controlling Austria, which itself will become divided during the course of the chronology of the stream, towards the end of the stream, the Habsburgs will not only occupy the imperial office, but they will also occupy the thrones of Castile, of Aragon, of Naples, of Sicily, of Burgundy, essentially most of Europe, and they will continue to expand those domains even further beyond this point. So without further ado, oh, just to explain, um, Marcus and Columba are currently AWOL. <laughs> I don't know where they are, so this is going to be a solar stream. We might be having a last minute substitution from Panama Hat, so he may pop in eventually during the stream. But um, do bear with me until then, for now it is going to be a solo stream, if that is all right with everyone. So beginning this conversation, of course, we covered this subject briefly on our episode on the Great Interregnum. Uh, we basically covered everything from the expansion of the Germans across the River Elbe, to include Brandenburg, the Ossiedlung, the Eastern settling essentially. And then we turned it around and talked about the first rise of the Habsburgs where Rudolf I, who was a vassal of the Hohenstaufens, was able to defeat the Bohemian King at the Battle of Marchfeld and establish not only his control over Germany, but his dynastic possession in Austria. However, after that point, the Habsburgs were contested by two other major um, royal families, one being the House of Wittelsbach from Bavaria, and the other being the House of Luxembourg, um, which of course, you know, originated from Luxembourg, but they would position themselves, their center of power would come from the Kingdom of Bohemia. And after the, you can say the expansionist reigns of Henry VII for the House of Luxembourg, who, you know, in all likelihood was probably poisoned. Uh, the expectation at the time was that he was poisoned by um, King Philip the Fair of France, who of course, if you see in our stream on France, was incredibly aggressive and expansionist, and it probably wouldn't surprise anyone had, it be, had um, Philip been involved in Henry's death. And then of course you have Louis IV, the eponymous Bavarian, who established Vittel's back control over Brandenburg, over Tyrol, and over much of the Low Countries, which would then become the subject of later Burgundian succession. So into this, the Habsburgs have been in basically continued decline. And then you have the elevation of the weak emperor, Charles IV, who rather than fighting against this process of, you know, the gradual erosion of central authority after the demise of the Hohenstaufens, we see this um, uh, bizarre situation where such anarchy is legalized or ratified through the Golden Bull of 1356. So many of the procedures which have been established, you know, such as imperial elections and basically the independence of all of these various principalities from imperial authority were ratified through the Golden Bull. Um, in addition to, you know, setting up a series of um, ceremonial offices, um, seven electors were established. So this would be the ecclesiastical electors, the archbishops of Cologne, of Trier, and of Mainz, and the secular princes, the Count of the Palatinate of the Rhine, uh, the Duke of Saxony, and the Margrave of Brandenburg, and of course the most exalted of all these electors, the King of Bohemia, who also so happened to be the emperor at this point. Now, the effect of this was that before then, popes had regularly got involved to interfere with the appointment of a king, 
and they would often promote an anti-king in opposition to a Holy Roman Emperor they didn't like. This is what, of course, happened with Frederick II Hohenstaufen. So one of the provisions of this bill was to remove the Pope's influence from directly appointing an emperor. After this point, the Pope could confirm and simply um, crown an emperor in Rome. His actual position in terms of nominating his own candidate was basically erased through this proposal. And as I explained, this was essentially a legalized process of anarchy. So the electoral principalities were declared indivisible. In theory, this was to ensure that their votes for the emperor wouldn't be divided. You know, if you had many claimants for, say, for example, the Margarita Brandenburg, the Margarita Brandenburg wouldn't keep splitting. So you had many people claiming that right to vote. Um, in theory, again, this made the election system smoother. But in reality, it established these states in particular as sovereign, independent virtually in all but name, albeit part of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, sovereign, I think, is too strong a word. I'll backtrack on that and rather advocate for the word autonomous instead. However, there was a clever provision in the Golden Bull where there were policies which were essentially stipulated to damage the main rivals of the house from which the emperor derived, the House of Luxembourg. The main, of course, opponents to this were the House of Habsburg and the House of Luxembourg. Um, the idea of creating an indivisible, indivisible state essentially meant that, you know, areas such as Bohemia couldn't be divided and disintegrated. However, the two rival houses came from Bavaria and Austria. Neither Bavaria or Austria were granted an electoral dignity. And as a result of that, essentially, um, these lands had no legal prevention mechanism to avoid them basically collapsing and disintegrating as a result of constant dynastic strife. Um, the weird thing is, of course, that the House of Wittelsbach was actually given two electoral sh uh, electoral ranks, one in Brandenburg and one in the Palatinate. But the main house, the house which were descended from the previous emperor, Louis IV, in Bavaria, uh, where the Wittelsbach got most of their resources and manpower, uh, was left out of this for the sole intention of allowing this land to disintegrate and become a site of constant strife and battles. Um, and of course, this is exactly what happened. Um, one of the sons of Louis the Fourth, Louis V, um, was able to hold nominal headship over Upper Bavaria and the County of Tyrol until his death in 1361, after which Bavaria essentially disintegrated. And of course, this was also extended to the Habsburgs. Now, the Wittelsbach had at least been given the rank of elector, in this case twice, in Brandenburg and in the Palatinate. But the Habsburgs, despite again being one of the main houses in Germany at this point, were snubbed even further. They weren't given any special privileges, any of these ceremonial ranks, all the ability to elect an emperor in the future. In response to this, the then um, Duke of Austria, Rudolf IV, also known as Rudolf the Founder, uh, convoked this novel strategy of trying to bolster the prestige of, of his house. Um, going back to the reign of Frederick Barbarossa, there was a, um, a famous um, declaration called the Privilege Minus, and Rudolf IV essentially officiated over a forging, a forgery of a new document called the Privilege Maius, whereby Austria was ostensibly granted all of these special privileges all the way back during the reign of Frederick Barbarossa some 200 years before. And conveniently, these new rights which Austria had been granted, you know, even before the Golden Bull apparently, um, gave Austria essentially the same rights of an, as an elector, the right to have an indivisible territory with primogeniture to avoid fragmentation and therefore diminishing the power of the House of Habsburg. And of course, in addition to that, he was elevated or rather elevated himself to the rank of Archduke over Austria. Essentially, before then, he had been a duke, and this was to give Austria some sort of dignity which was above that of the other minor princes of Germany. But of course, this was ignored, essentially, by all the other princes, and it didn't prevent the ultimate disintegration of Austria in the short term. Um, however, before we get to the rise of, ha the, rise of the Habsburgs, I do want to um, give a brief summary about the sort of developments we're seeing in anti-Reformation Germany, if that is all right with everyone. So essentially, you know, 
the period which you know coincides with the golden bull is also a time of great cultural great economic and great demographic change in germany you'd already had the massive explosion in population in the 200 years prior you had the Ossiedlung, the east settling so as you can see on this map where the boundary used to be at the elbe and now you're seeing pomerania you're now seeing prussia you're now seeing silesia and of course the Ossiedlung has also encroached upon you know not normally czech areas such as bohemia and moravia at the same time um, this, of course, came to a drastic close with the Black Death. The Black Death stopped the eastern migration of the Germans and it resulted in potentially around the loss of 40% of the population of Germany, as was the case, sadly, throughout most of Europe during this time. Um, but during this time, we also see a major shift in the German language. Um, during the reign of the Hohenstaufens, uh, the Swabian or the, um, the Alemannic dialect had emerged as the prestige dialect, essentially the literary or the um, official dialect of essentially the, the Holy Roman Empire due to the political prominence of the Duchy of Swabia, which of course was the um, main power center for the Hohenstaufen dynasty. But of course, you have the extermination of the Hohenstaufen dynasty after Frederick II with the, the rise of Philip of Anjou and Swabia undergoes one of the most dramatic um, political disunifications in history, essentially. It goes from one of the strongest of the, you know, original German stem duchies, which had been established, you know, all the way back since, you know, even before the, the reign of the Carolingians. And it becomes one of the most divided states and also home to most of the later free and imperial cities. Uh, the effect of this was that um, we see the emergence of a new literary tradition. Columba. Hello, I'm terribly sorry about that, buddy. So sorry to all who are listening as well. All right, well... Um, uh, a little bit Panama of fires on my end. Uh, Panama Hat might be joining us. Um, we still have no word from um, Furious Pertinac, so we'll... I, I feel he may have made the same mistake that I did. Yes. Yeah. Um, have you been following what I've been saying or like anything? You want to <laughs> no, hear? no, I, I, I was, um, I was having dinner until a couple of minutes ago, so I'm just going to have to, I, I'll, I'll figure it out. Just, uh, I'm sorry for interrupting. Just carry on. All right. All right. Well, I've essentially been discussing the development of language, um, from the 13th to the 14th century, how the Hohenstaufens, um, as the Dukes of Swabia turned the Swabian dialect of German into basically a prestige dialect within Germany. But of course, you then have their political disintegration in the 13th century. And as a result of that, during this period, so we're talking post the Golden Bull, post 1356, um, this is roughly corresponds to the period where we see early new high German. And, you know, this period of language, if anyone wants to, wants to know, begins roughly in 1350 and goes all the way to the end of the Thirty Years' War in 1648. And, and why, um... And why exactly was uh, Swabia so prestigious? Um, uh, yes, like I said, it was the um, it was the it was the dukedom of the Hohenstaufen emperors, essentially. Oh, of course, yeah. So of all the of all the stem duchies, this I mean, you know, you had the the, the stem duchy, say for example, of Franconia, the city of Worms, for example, mm. which um, had you know particular prestige for the um, uh, the Salian dynasty, for example. Uh, before then, the Ottonians had come from Saxony. Uh, the Hohenstaufens had come from Swabia. So you know, again, it's like what we see with Austria and later Saxony in the north. It's some um, uh, mm. linguistic sort of preeminence is stemming from political preeminence in this case, and this is you know, and, no exception. And of course. Um... Yeah, and of course, once you have Gutenberg come along and you have the rise of printing, this process becomes a lot easier, right? Because it's, mm -hmm. you're able to spread and disseminate texts at a much larger rate. And of course, it's much easier to formalize a language or to um, extend your power through through language. Yes, and um, the, the printing press and Gutenberg, and of course, we're talking about court languages, um, have several interesting effects, which I'll, which I'll quickly go into here. So with the expansion into the Ossiedlung, you see, on the one hand, you see an expansion of all these different dialects eastwards. Um, however, and you also see Dutch breaking off from German and becoming basically its own language, which is going to eventually become modern Dutch during the, the 16th and the 17th centuries. However, within these dialects, these German dialects, we are seeing more sort of conformity within those dialects. So we're seeing the emergence of Upper German, 
Central German and Low German. Now, Low German, interestingly, of course, is the language which is associated with the Hanseatic League, but the language basically declines with the fortunes of the Hanseatic League, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, when we're talking about, you know, Upper and General German, um, these during the late 15th century and um, early 16th century um, become the so-called uh, Schliefsprachen, or the chancery languages emanating from the uh, court of Maximilian in Vienna and the court of, um, oh, what's his name? <laughs> I've forgotten now the um, uh, the elector of um, Saxony, but anyway, no, it's the... Um, and so when you're oh, saying got... upper, and upper and lower here, is that from the perspective of the rivers? Because, of course, you said yes. the Hans League, and they're in the north. So, yeah. Yes. Oh, we are joined by hat. Panama Hat. Good evening, chaps. Um, Hello. I, I, <laughs> I, I, like I, you... I join you still from still from the uh, sick bay, uh, but <laughs> oh. <laughs> here nonetheless. The lurgy is going around these days, isn't it? Mike? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's, it's hitting hard. Anyway. Wonderful work. <laughs> anyway, so, so, I didn't mean to interrupt that. A very, um, a very, very late, um, late substitution for this stream, but um, <laughs> literally minutes ago, <laughs> we'll carry on regardless. Um, so yes, whilst you have the um, the Habsburg um, uh, Chancery language from Vienna, and you have the Vettin Chancery language from Saxony, um, these again become the prestige dialects of Germany. So whilst Swabia had been the center of a previous prestige dialects, these dialects essentially become the beginning of standard writing in German, essentially throughout the um, the rest of the High Middle Ages and into the early modern period. And when and you say course, chancery, chancery language, so that inclines me to think that this is the also, I mean, the language of administration, and that's yes, also the language, part of docu the documentary language, yes, document yeah. languages or office languages, yes, precisely. So just bringing in um, uh, Gutenberg, so you've, you've just mentioned him, um, uh, Columba. Uh, Gutenberg really does represent a, a total revolution, not just um, in the dissemination of information, but in the arts in Germany as well, and of course in the administration. So from 1436 until 1440, uh, Gutenberg had you know, trained essentially as a goldsmith. And even though, I mean, there had been letter presses and um, the printing presses operating in um, China uh, during this time. Uh, Gutenberg invents uh, the printing press in the West, essentially. And from 1440, in his little um, print shop in Mainz, he's able to produce the first um, uh, rep uh, replicatable high quality books. And in 1454, uh, this culminates with the uh, Latin language Gutenberg Bible, essentially. And of course, for any sort of, you know, anyone with knowledge of the subsequent reformation uh, this is going to be a incredibly useful tool for the dissemination of um of the works of luther later on yes and i believe um i believe there were earlier attempts at printing if i'm not mistaken but the thing about gutenberg is is i mean it's also the process that he invented from what i know about it is very simple you know very very easy to do and very easy to build the machine and so it spread yes. very quickly um one thing i also read about recently um it was an interesting. I've been reading this book about the Reformation, and he made the point that, um, and I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's true or if it's, I don't know, Protestant slander, but um, um, he made the point that indulgences were also printed, and essentially you had a a, a a vast increase in indulgences on account of printing, and this was one of the um, one of the causes of discontent. Um, what, what do you make of that, Ian? <laughs> Uh, to be fair, that wouldn't actually, I mean, I need to read this, but just on a first glance, that wouldn't actually surprise me. Yeah, because you needed a certificate, didn't you, with the Pope's, with the Pope's seal, and I suppose, um, I suppose they probably did print them, yeah. But more so than that, you have the, the rise of the, um, the Renaissance Popes, you have the rise of very ambitious Popes, we're talking about, um, Rodrigo Borgia, later Alexander mm. VI, and, um, mm. uh, Della Rovere, who would later become Julius II, who are trying to accumulate <laughs> who funds. Had some, who had some strong words to say about his predecessor, to say the least. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> Let not, him not be expunged wholesome. from the pages of history, you know. Not the most wholesome period of the papacy. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yes, well, or join us on Monday when we discuss the um, Renaissance <laughs> papacy. Uh, but for now, at least, um, yes, this um, 
the the Vatican is trying to construct a new a, a new Saint Peter's essentially because the old one has been virtually eclipsed by you know many other churches in Europe. So this um, corresponding increase in the sale of indulgences facilitated by the printing press um, uh, does make sense from that point of view. Uh, just in terms of like the proliferation of the printing press itself, so you know it starts off in in Mainz, which of course is in the centre of Germany. You know Mainz in the centre of Franconia is the heart of um, ancient, uh, ancient Carolingian rule in Germany. Germany. Uh, from there, it expands to Cologne, and by 1500, so just in the space of about 60 years, um, 40 uh, towns in Germany have print shops, and this is just going to massively increase towards the towards the beginning of the Reformation. Of course, it's not just in Germany either. You have um, uh, printing presses established in Venice. You have printing presses established in London, in Paris. So this becomes not just a German phenomena, but a European phenomena. And um, going back to what you were saying, Columba, about um, you know what the effects on language are. Well, on the one hand, you have the the chancery languages, which are emanating out of the courts. But here you have you, you can almost say a form of um, of um, market uh, language standardisation, essentially. Um, yeah, because it, it needs to be done for trade and business primarily. Yes, precisely. And, you know, there isn't a standard German, essentially, to reference for all of these texts. You know, all of these individual towns which are producing, you know, um, uh, the printed works have their own regional dialects, essentially. So there was essentially a, a grassroots impetus, um, rather than just aiming for the local town district, to try and make the words in the printed form intelligible to as many people as possible. So here we see the creation of what are called the Druckersprachen, or the, the languages of the impression, or literally the print languages, whereby we're not seeing the creation of standard German, but we are seeing the consolidation of these regional dialects as a result of this, again, impetus from the printmakers to try and appeal to as wide an audience as possible. Yeah. And you also have loads of beautiful um simple types which is along the same sort of principle because a lot of um you know medieval texts and manuscripts um even if you hold it yourself and you're right close to it it's you know devilishly difficult to read um whereas you know in the age of printing not only is it being proliferated but the the printing itself lends towards much clearer types and so you get these beautiful um beautiful types appearing i wish we had dion because he's such an expert in those things um mm. but another point i would like to bring up in the sort of general culture of of germany at the time um you mentioned that gutenberg's um um he trained under or his father was a goldsmith and that's mm. and that's something that's absolutely key because i'm i was reading um fisher again recently and fisher's fisher's a bit of a wig <clears throat> but um he does he does make a very compelling point when he when he talks about you know italy it's painting um um and you know each country has these sort of um things that they're they really truly excel at um you know the netherlands painting as well somewhat but in germany at this time in the in the states of germany we really see craftsmanship you know um, um clocks and and mechanical instruments um, um and and weapons and things like this um reaching a level of craftsmanship that's just never been reached before you know even in even in say the roman period um it's just totally exceptional i mean you have um there i think there, i think his name was aeneas silvius um no 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 um aeneas something but he was an italian um traveler who was in germany in sort of the 1400s and he talks about augsburg as being you know the richest the richest city in um, i've ever laid eyes upon um the average merchant in augsburg li lives better than the king of scotland lives <laughs> he actually he actually <laughs> says that um and, and there's just this incredibly high level of individual um um craftsmen and this of course is translated into printing um you see it in the art style i mean i'm pretty sure durer's dad was some sort of craftsman as well um and, and again you see it in the style as well we talked about this last time in our stream on um um burgundy you know the the burgundian cloth trade lends itself to men like jan van eyck and that mm -hmm. very exact style um we see similar things happening in germany with men like durer as well and i think um that that's a very important point which is that the invention of the Gutenberg printing press uh, facilitates what you can say the artistic northern renaissance in Germany. So before in our previous stream on Burgundy, which you know, I hope there is some sort of continuity which people can notice, um, we see the 
birth essentially of Flemish and Dutch manufacturing in an area which had basically been seen as uninhabitable since antiquity. And this creates this um, amazing outpouring of not just um, court culture, but also bourgeoisie culture in the Low Countries. With the German invention of the Gutenberg Press in Mainz, this um, whole process is export. It's not only it's not exported to Germany, but Germany becomes a cultural innovator, and it's through this process of the woodcut, um, the woodblock, and the engraving. And you mentioned um, uh, Dürer in his his role in this. Um, it was his godfather, Anton um, Koberger who was was basically you know a goldsmith and of course albert drew yeah, like um uh, gutenberg was also um uh, trained as a goldsmith and koberger would publish this beautiful illustrated encyclopedia uh schadel's world history or the the nuremberg chronicle essentially so you mentioned augsburg as one of these um incredibly wealthy cities but of course nuremberg is another one cologne yes, Dur is another Durer one. was from nuremberg right yes exactly yeah um you know, cities like Munich aren't as prominent, say, for example, as of yet as cities like Regensburg. Of course, the largest city in the Holy Roman Empire isn't technically in Germany, but it's Prague. And of course, that is, as of now, the imperial city. Uh, it'll later become, of course, um, Vienna. Uh, so all of these um, things are happening at the same time. And of course, one of the, the facets of Nuremberg Chronicle, you know, talking about this creation, creation of the uh, Deluca Sprachen, is, of course, it's originally printed in Latin. And then it is then translated into the Austro uh, uh, into the Franconian vernacular, and you know because of course Nuremberg, along with many cities in just north of Bavaria, centre of this um, area in Germany known as Franconia. So really, under Albrecht Dürer, uh, Germany replaces Burgundy as the leader of the Northern Renaissance. And when we get to the end of the stream, you're going to see a hopefully see a wonderful continuity with the dynastic link of Maria Burgundy and Maximilian and how this mm. has been consciously imported as well through the court, through Burgundy. But we'll, we'll leave that when we talk about um, Maximilian I. Yeah. Um, I, I would just like to add quickly that um, in terms of the Northern Renaissance as well, um, Gutenberg's printing also, I mean, you mentioned the sort of rise of the, um, the sort of middle class or the gentry in this, in this new movement as well. Of course, um, we have the creation of the first sort of literary celebrities in Europe, right? And the the prime man. I mean, you mentioned the Netherlands there being Erasmus, of course. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the and one of the main reasons. I mean, Erasmus was very friendly with the printers in Germany and in the Netherlands, and this um th this allowed him to when he when he wrote his um his praise of folly. Um, this was printed and widely disseminated, and he became and he became a sort of household name amongst that sort of gentry. And indeed, um. You know, despite Erasmus's um, um, loyalty to the church, um, with what came later, um, um, I think Albrecht Dürer himself was actually, um, he wrote a letter or a public proclamation to Erasmus celebrating him, calling him a, a knight of Christ, you know, and and, um, and celebrating his, his criticism of the church. And so you can see this sort of intersection there between the printing and this new humanistic culture and then the sort of um craftsmen and artisans men like durer um and of course you know uh, looking at it from a broader picture you can say that this might this is the sort of birth of um um the control of technics i guess is what oswald spengler would call it you know this sort of exact laser-like focus on work and business um and craftsmanship which has led to the world we live in today for the most part i i'd probably be a bit um kinder than than spengler i think again what we're talking about is one of the reasons why we draw a distinction between the medieval ages and the early modern period. Of course, from a geopolitical point of view, this would coincide with the end of the Hundred Years' War and the fall of Constantinople. From a view of navigation, this involves the discovery of the new world, which of course is going on during the later time of this period. And of course, the other is this proliferation of information. You can say the success of humanism and how it was able to become so successful from the, the very late um, 15th century until the early 16th century is due to the ability of all these academics basically to communicate via you know what was then mass media, something which had been inconceivable before that point. So all of these um, developments are key for, you can say, the creation of 
for lack of a better word, a modern world, essentially. Um, but going back to the political aspect of this, because this stream, from a political point of view, is mainly going to focus on Austria for the sake of brevity. I mean, I could go into the political disintegration of Bavaria, but I'd probably kill off <laughs> what, what remains of our audience here. I think just talking <laughs> about it from um, the Austrian point of view is more is difficult enough without bringing in the Wittelsbach and bringing in the Wettins. Um, mm. But yes, just to give a very brief summary, summary of... Um, basically the world that was codified as a result of Charles the fourth some um, golden bull of 1356 um as we talked about Germany had been essentially fundamentally feudal in its conception as East Francia under the Etonians now Germany was home to noble authority as you can see on this incredibly complicated map um, ecclesiastical authority, there are many powerful bishoprics, and we see the rise of the Bürgerliche, the town dwellers, in various cities. Now these cities, you know, what is an imperial city? Well, an imperial city was essentially meant to be founded as a city directly under the control of the emperor and ruled over by a Vukta or a steward. And of course, many of these were in Swabia, and of course when Swabia collapsed politically in the second half of the 13th century, uh, these imperial cities basically became self-governing because there was no imperial authority to hold them in check any longer. At the same time, within these ecclesiastical authorities, you mentioned Augsburg, and Augsburg is a good example. You have a Augsburg was officially a bishoporic, but the city of Augsburg itself was a free city. Um, the same thing would happen with Cologne. Um, the, elector the electorate of Cologne, you know, ostensibly the capital was at Cologne, but of course Cologne would eventually become a free city. And the residents of the Prince Bishop Elector of Cologne would then move to the city of Bonn, which will later become capital of West Germany, uh, just to make all this a little bit more complicated. Um, but by, you know, the, the late 14th century, early 15th century, um, because of this, you know, political disintegration, uh, the distinction between what was meant by an imperial city and what was meant by a free city had basically become irrelevant. So after this period, especially after the 16th century, they're always almost referred to as free and imperial cities. And coincidentally, they sometimes organize into larger confederations. One such one would be the uh, Decapol. Um, in Alsace, which of course was still part of the Holy Roman Empire at this time, it hadn't yet been annexed by France. Uh, and another more famous one, which is going to prop up uh, repeatedly in our discussions as it pertains to the Habsburgs, is the consolidation of the cantons into the, essentially the, the warrior elite, which represents the Swiss Confederacy. And the yeah, other- that's a, point I was, that's a point I was gonna make because I read briefly about, um, and I know it's a bit of an aside to this stream, but um, one of the causes of dissatisfaction that led up to you know the Swabian War and Swiss independence was essentially the Swiss were trying to bypass their own local nobility and and get that imperial status, you know, that place themselves directly under the emperor, which gives you that independence. Um, so yes. it's, a, it's a it's a recurring problem. What you what you're talking about um, is imperial immediacy, which again, like we we discussed in our last stream about the disintegration of the um, the Aralat. Um, I, the idea of putting yourself directly under the control of the emperor ironically gives you far more autonomy because you're more likely to be controlled by a more immediate authority, say, for example, a local duke or a local elector, than you are by an emperor who's always essentially trying to hold on to what little possessions he has, let alone all the, the empire as a whole, as we're going to discuss. You know, basically, <laughs> Especially if it's a Habsburg em emperor who has to spend all yeah, of his time so. roaming from possession to possession, yeah. Pity the yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just just a quick summary on um, uh, the Hanseatic League, because this uh, uh, flows on nicely from our talk on Burgundy. Um, so the height of the Hanseatic League, you know, roughly corresponds to the, this period, essentially the late 14th century and the early 15th century, or by albeit by the end of the anti-Reformation German period, uh, it has undergone a uh, severe decline. On the one hand, you have competition from the Kalmar Union, uh, one of the reasons ostensibly for, you know, such political goodwill and forming the Kalmar Union. For people who don't know, the Kalmar Union is the union of Sweden and Norway under Denmark. And this lasted for about 100 years until it was broken during the beginning of the Reformation, um, was to compete in Baltic, in Baltic trade with the Hanseatic League, which controlled cities all the way from, uh, they had uh, connections in Novgorod, through to Riga, through to Danzig, 
through to Lübeck, which was the, the most preeminent of all the cities in the Hanseatic League, through to Bremen, through to Hamburg, etc. And of course, terminating when we have the the the, the emergence of Dutch competition, essentially over you know control of the uh, north, um, the North Sea in particular, and this and results in the. Oh. Were they also clashing over the, I mean, we've talked about, you know, the Volga trade routes and what have you, um, because of course, you know, the body of water up there, you know, leads right into there and then you come out into the North Sea. And so it's absolutely vital to hold the straits there. Was there conflict between the Hanseatics and, and the Kalmar League over that as well? Uh, regarding the Volga, no. Regarding the Vistula, um, the Vistula is the main river that runs through Poland. Um, absolutely, because you're during this period, the late sort of um, 15th century, you're seeing the decline of the Teutonic order. You're seeing the consolidation mm -hmm. of Poland and Lithuania as a single power under the Jagiellon dynasty. And uh, the main city which the Poles need to control in order to have any sort of economic influence over the region is the city of Dan Danzig, which of course is modern day Gdansk. And they are going to take over this territory and incorporate it into royal Prussia, essentially, which will remain part of Poland all the way up until the partitions of Poland in the late 18th century. So in Tr terms trouble, of trouble with Danzig, where have I heard that before? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms in the of end, Poland begins. Yes, this, this is where it all begins. Yeah. So in terms of um, the the Vistula, yes, uh, th that is a fundamental um, bone of contention. And the fact that the Poles are rising comes at the expense of the power of the Hanseatic League. Um, but coming back to the Dutch, you know, the Dutch Hanseatic League, you know, note the dates 1438 to 1441. Uh, Philip the Good has just basically co-opted these duchies from uh, the Wittelsbach into his, you know, burgeoning empire, essentially. So with the backing of, you know, the, the might of the House of Burgundy, the Dutch are directly competing with the trade monopoly of the Hanseatic League, so much so that Amsterdam, towards the end of the 15th century, uh, was referred to as the mother city of all trades, um, again, demonstrating the, the relative decline of the Hanseatic League. So on the one hand, we're seeing the proliferation of all of these cities and these leagues, essentially, of cities banding together for economic and military defense purposes. As it, on the other hand, we're also seeing the decline of the Hanseatic League relative to these new powers. And of course, it's not just an economic decline, it's also a cultural decline because we're seeing the, the rise of the chancery languages at the expense of low German. Of course, we're talking about the river Rhine, essentially, um, the upper river referring to places like Bavaria and the lower region referring to places such as uh, Frisia and the Weser. Um, so, and, and again, there's also one little point to note, which I think we'll, we'll come into later, which is the, the great bullion crisis of the late 15th century. Uh, there was a great shortage of silver and other precious metals. And the way that the Dutch in particular and the Italians got around this was through the creation of fiat currency of paper money. Uh, but from the Hanseatic League's point of view, um, they are still relying on silver currency. And so due to the deficiency of silver currency, their own economic potential declines. And this is really only going to change very later on when the Habsburgs in alliance with the, uh, the Fuga family um, are able to massively expand uh, mining operations in the Tyrol. I've heard of Fugger. He was he was ludicrously wealthy, was he not? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So yes, um, unless either of you two have um anything to just general points to make about Germany, we can get on to the um, uh, the rise of the Habsburgs was, from um, um, humble beginnings. I was going to ask a point because I know that the Hanseatic League. Um, well, I, I was going to ask if you count London as being one of the Hanseatic. Uh, uh, ports essentially, because I, I do know that um, was it Henry the Second had dealings with, with the Hanseatic League. Uh, it would be uh, Henry the Seventh, no, or Henry the Sixth, because um, Henry the Second's too early for the Hanseatic. Oh yes, League. it is. Sorry, yes, Henry the yeah, much would be much later, wouldn't it? No, but you uh, had um in London, you had the Steel Yard, which was essentially a sort of square for German merchants, Hans merchants, to come and sell their wares, and so they they, they had a they had a huge presence in the city of London, actually. Yes, but what, wasn't it some kind of like free trade area? Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm not sure. I only know that I, at certain times they really. I, I remember very well. reading a an essay uh, talking about various types of uh, subversion, um, and uh, it was a very it was a very anti-German essay, and it, it was it was talking about how the, uh, the the Hanseatic League kind of 
did a did some political sh- sh- chicanery and got um the king of england to recognize a kind of uh, tax-free area <laughs> in this in the in the middle of london for them i wouldn't i wouldn't be surprised i mean and they were yeah. also um they were also involved in sort of the um um the counter the not the counterfeit what's the word the contraband book trade and things like yes. that you know reformation texts um sort of german subversive. merchants yeah <laughs> deeply deeply subversive <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I think just one one note. I, I will sort of come into that. Okay, I, th- I think I have something to say, and not not about the specifics, but just about the the, gen- the generalities. Um, the Fuga family were, um, especially Jacob Fuga, were based in Augsburg. In terms of your comment about um, wealth, Columba. Um regarding like London, um, Edward the Fourth, I believe, had a very um, successful relationship with the Hanseatic League. So much so that the Hanseatic League were bankrolling the Yorkist cause. During yeah, the, um, yeah, the, he used to um, he used to constantly yeah, it was actually quite a big deal because he would dine at the guild hall with the merchants and he would constantly invite the merchants and the cloth dealers um, um, to to his castles and you know a lot of the nobles were were quite upset by this. I think I think Edward the Fourth actually had um, investments in cloth himself. He was actually a merchant himself. Yes, exactly. Um, so, w- without further ado, we'll we'll go on to uh, go on to the Habsburgs. So, I ended off, you know, I, I think I, it was just me talking um, by myself um, uh, with the uh, privilege of Miles and Rudolf the Fourth, the founder. Um, Rudolf the Fourth was a very ambitious, very charismatic ruler who had the awful misfortune of dying too young, too young to produce a male heir. Because from 1358 until 1365, he had tried everything in his power to compensate for being essentially shafted out of the provisions of the Golden Bull and to consolidate the dignity and the integrity of the domains of the House of Habsburg. And you know, of course, his own elevation to that of Archduke. However, of course, this failed, and you know, we we see a, the, the almost the exact same situation happening with Bavaria. Bavaria begins to disintegrate around the year um, uh, 1461. Uh, the only sucker, really, for Rudolf IV is that Tyrol switches sides from the Wittelsbach to the Habsburg families, therefore acquiring those um, towns which are going to become very important for the mining operations later on. Uh, But apart from that, he dies at the age of 25. And in order to try and desperately hold on to his territory, he wills um, his empire to his two brothers, uh, Albert and Leopold. And just so people can follow along with what I'm talking about, so this doesn't become horrifically complicated going down. Um, on the this is a later map, however, it more or less corresponds to the borders of the Habsburg territories then. Um, in the northeast, around you know, between Vienna and the city of Linz. Um, we have Austria pro- proper, essentially the old Duchy of Austria, which includes Upper Austria and Lower Austria. Now, this area in the south, uh, which also includes a large part of modern day Slovenia, uh, refers to what we call Inner Austria, which includes uh, Styria, Carinthia, and Carniola. And here in the west, we have these. Um, tiny little disconnected possessions which constituted the original Habsburg lands under Rudolf I before the base of the the family was moved to Austria after the Battle of Marchfeld and this constitutes further Austria whilst this um, segment you know corresponding to the Brenner Pass essentially is the you know incredibly uh, strategically significant county of Tyrol And, and of course in the middle of all these territories there is Switzerland why you know the constant feuds between the Habsburgs and the Swiss is going to be a reason as to why you see um, such a desire to push for Swiss autonomy, essentially within the empire, because of a desire to connect all of these um, disparate territories. And of course, I think you can see from this map, looking at further Austria, uh, that is the legacy of the original collapse of Swabia at the same time, this um, this passing out of the territory and then having to consolidate in the east. Um, so, so you have further Austria and then inner Austria, right? Yes, Inner Austria is on the southeast corner of this map, and Further Austria is in the northwest corner of this oh, map. Ah, I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yes, without without further ado, we'll go on. Um, it appeared, you know, from 1365 until 1379, you had the joint reign of the two brothers. Um, things were going, you know, relatively well. 
um, they were able to defend jointly to roll against uh, you know, the, the attempt of the Wittelsbach of Bavaria to take um, the county back. Uh, they were able to incorporate Istria in the in the far south um, on the borders of Venice. They were ultimately able to acquire the city of Trieste, which is going to become the main port of the, the empire moving forward, as well as um, other parts of um, Slovenia at the same time. However, the fact that you have two brothers, you know, ruling over the duchy eventually um, leads to a final breach uh, between the two brothers, and this is the um, the so-called Treaty of Neuburg, whereby you have a, there the. Was a, sorry, I was just there was a fourth brother as well. Did did he die, or or was he removed somehow? Uh, yes, there was a fourth, fourth. There was a fourth brother who died in 1362. So he died oh, okay. three years before before Rudolf. I'm very lucky that I actually remembered that. But um, there yes, there, there were four, including um, Rudolf and Rudolf's younger brother. Yes. Um, so of the two surviving brothers, we have the um, the Treaty of Neuburg, and just to explain, Inner Austria and further Austria, which includes Tyrol. So basically um, this area in the south, the southern half, essentially in the western part, was given to Leopold. And the northern part, which includes the city of Vienna, was given to Albert. And these, this is basically establishes the Leopoldian and Albertine branches of the family. Now to make this even more complicated, which is why I'm not going to touch Bavaria in the stream, um, you would often have um, you know, rulers dying prematurely from each of the families and the other family ruling over those territories as regent. In addition to that, you would further see those branches dividing territories amongst themselves as well. And in addition to that, you also sometimes have brothers holding that same rank, that diminished rank at the same time, all competing over legitimacy. So from 1365... <laughs> excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Just excellent. <laughs> Which is why um, Rudolf the Fourth was so obsessed with unity, because he had the foresight to understand that as a result of the Golden Bull, this essentially could happen, and he did everything in his power to defeat it. But of course, he was you know defeated by time essentially. But this is going to be a state of affairs. The division of Austria will continue from 1365 all the way until 1490, when finally the the situation is resolved through um, uh, Sigismund being bought out by um, by Maximilian. Um, getting back to you know you know Leopold and Albert, uh, Leopold tries to connect uh, to roll with further Austria, and he is famously killed, and his army is wiped out by the Swiss at the Battle of Sempach, and this is where Albert begins his first regency over the Leopoldian branch of the family. Um, at the same time, he then goes. Um, Albert then goes and um, fights the Swiss again only to be defeated at the Battle of Niefels. So um, the Swiss are proving, as we ultimately, uh, the, the culmination of our stream on Burgundy was the incredible Swiss victory at the Battle of Grandson and the Battle of Nancy against um, Charles of Burgundy. You can say the Habsburgs were basically tempering their blade, their blades a hundred years before their eventual um, fateful um, conflict with the House of Burgundy. Yes, the Swiss are really showing their own. I mean, you know, battle after battle, they're winning in this period. I mean, you know, it's the it's the first stage of um, um, sort of pike formations and stuff, which mm. we've talked about extensively. I mean, I think it was at the Battle of Sempach. It was um, it was the Austrian cavalry, and they were broken by pike squares. And so, yeah. Um, and then uh, there was also a sort of class element there as well, you know, because many of these these uh these pikemen and these swordsmen come from middle class craftsman mm. class gentry class whereas the cavalry of course are you know high aristocracy and so in that sense again we see um i mean you know wars of the roses we've commented on that as well you essentially have a bunch of you know english miscreants and criminals um mowing down the cream of the yeah. french aristocracy um welsh know. farmers yeah. <laughs> welsh farmers <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's, not, he's not wrong um yes. So, so yes, this is, and again, this is coinciding with the creation of the Swiss Confederacy. Um, the Confederacy is formed in part. I think, you know, to my mind, the decisive sort of formation of the Confederacy happens in the 16th century, you know, 1499 between 1513. Uh, but this is where we begin to see that initial consolidation from the year 1300 onwards. And it's driven by this um, uh, routine conflict with the Habsburgs. Uh, but in addition to their conflict with the Swiss, Oh, there's also someone in the chat has noted. Um, you see this massive white space in the middle of Austria, which of course is today part of Austria. Uh, that is the uh, Bishoporic of Salzburg, 
which will later become the um, the Prince Bishoporic of Salzburg. Um, this will not be incorporated into Austria until the Napoleonic period. So um, this gaping, and again, you know, other little territories, these mirror territories, there's going to be a lot of consolidation essentially, but it's going to wait another um, 400 years until we get to Napoleon. Um, the other conflict, of course, going on during this time is the conflict between the Wittelsbach, which we've alluded to briefly, and the, um, the House of Luxembourg. Essentially, after Charles IV died in 1378, uh, the Holy Roman Empire was ruled over by the incompetent King Wenceslaus, uh, so much so that he was opposed not only by all of the families, he was opposed by his own brothers as well, his his cousin Jobst and his, um, his brother, younger brother, who was now King of Hungary, Sigismund. And... Um, he was so incompetent, I think we alluded to this in our, our great interregnum stream, uh, was finally actually deposed by a coalition of all these forces as King of Germany. He was allowed to remain as um, King of Bohemia. And there was a time where the Habsburgs potentially could have regained the um, the title of King of the Romans once more. Alas, Albert, who was the most effective and charismatic of the Habsburgs during this time, died in 1395. And instead, the Wittelsbach gained the title uh, with Rupert of, uh, Rupert of um, the Palatinate. And then the Luxembourgers you know, took it over again. And this is where we get to the the reign of the last uh, Luxembourg emperor, uh, Sigismund. But just, just, um, just quickly, because one, one thing that I learned that was quite interesting to my mind about Albert III is that um, his um, his German nickname was Albrecht uh, mit dem Zopf, um, or Zopf, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but it essentially means braid or ponytail. And if you look at portraits of him, he has this long, this long braided ponytail. And I was, um, I was reading about the, the origin of this, and apparently um, the story goes that some lady had given him a, a piece of her braid as a sort of, you know, token of affection or, or, um, or what have you. And so he created this chivalric order um, that were called the Zupforden, you know, the, the sort of order of the braid. Um, and it was a sort of an attempt at a chivalry order, but it also died out um, with him. And I just thought it was interesting because I remember on our Burgundy stream, uh, we were talking about the order of the Golden Fleece in Burgundy and how um, I thought it was quite quaint that um, um, they had chosen the Golden Fleece because of their of their massive wealth from cloth and what have you. Um, and then you see this, this order of the braid and, and indeed all of the knights wore this sort of ornamental metal sort of crown braid that would come off the side of their head. And it's so interesting at the same time they're trying to consolidate control in Swabia and what have you. Um, they, they are they are starting this order that's iconography is very, very similar to the Swabian knot, which was a classic sort of indication of you know Germanic tribesmen and what have you. So it's just another another funny little coincidence there. But um <laughs> so sorry, that, that that's all I wanted to know. No, I think it's interesting. I think um of course the the success of this order is, I mean, and the other order which I'm about to bring up with Sigismund is the Order of the Dragon. Um all of these orders were ultimately eclipsed by the the Habsburgs absorbing the mythology of the Order of the Golden Fleece and Fleece and making it their own essentially. So um these little orders, and I think again, linking that back to the, the Swabian knot again is is quite interesting. And again, illustrating that the roots of the dynasty, the roots of the Habsburgs were in Swabia. So so yes, just some um, where was I? I guess talking about um, uh, the Emperor Sigismund. So this is going to be a discussion about um, two personalities who come to power, you know, roughly around the same time. Uh, one is uh, Sigismund, the last Luxembourg emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And the other is Albert, the man who begins the second Habsburg rise after you can say the aborted rise under um, Rudolf I. Um, we see, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we have these um, repeated premature deaths from the Albertine and the Leopoldian branches and these regencies being declared over these other branches to make things even more complicated. So in 1404, Albert, now Albert V, becomes the ruler of Austria proper of the Albertine branch of the family at the age of seven. And he has to basically assume control of the duchy in opposition from his uncle, Ernest the Lion, who is also fighting a conflict with his other brothers as well. And um, the Leopoldian branch of the family is basically dividing and crumbling at the same time. We're going to see a split where the Leopoldians will rule in Austria and another branch of the Leopoldians will rule further Austria. 
Um, but nevertheless, you know, Albert finally is able to assume personal control in 1411 at the same time that Sigismund is elected King of the Romans. And just a reminder to everyone that you could be elected King of the Romans, but you can't be Holy Roman Emperor at this point until you have a formal coronation by the Pope. So the King of the Romans is basically the elected Emperor of the Romans, um, but again, without the formal coronation. But Sigismund begins his you know, career even, you know, before that in 1387. You have the great king of Hungary, um, Louis the Great of the House of Anjou, who rules over an empire which, you know, spanned, you know, from the Black Sea to the Adriatic Sea and to the Baltic Sea, you know, as the um, the ruler essentially over the, 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 over the Balkan principalities, over Hungary, and over uh, over Poland at the same time. And you also have this um, connection with the original Angevin branch in Naples. Um, but as is the case, you know, so many times, he leaves no male heir. And he's replaced by his two daughters, Mary in Hungary and Hedwig in Poland. And coincidentally, Sigismund is able to marry Mary and claim uh, the Kingdom of Hungary, uh, Duolog Sordis, by right of his wife. And this leads to, you know, among other things which aren't really relevant to the stream, a contest with this Angevin branch in Naples. But then again, he leads also this um, crusading effort against the Ottomans, and this mm. results in you know, his participation in the disastrous a crusade of Nicopolis um, against Murad, in which you know a, a large section of the European nobility uh, fight. Many of them are killed, and of course, fighting alongside Sigismund is also um, John the Fearless of Burgundy. Referring this back to um, to our previous stream, um, of course, you know, in addition to having to deal with the Ottoman threat, and this is why I have a great deal of sympathy for Sigismund, um, he's having to deal with the incompetence of his older brother Wenceslaus and leads this effort essentially to depose him in 1400 as the power of the King of Bohemia is basically being com completely circumvented by the estates. You know, the, um, the, the House of Luxembourg in Bohemia didn't have to deal with the same issues as the House of Wittelsbach in Bavaria and the House of Habsburg in Austria, where they're constantly having to give off, you know, partable inheritance, essentially, where the land is being divided over and over again. Bohemia is able to retain its integrity, yet at the same time, because you have such an impossibly incompetent king as Wenceslaus, um, all of the estates instead all the nobility basically take power and his own authority is limited to Prague. And to make matters worse, you also have the rise of Jan Hus and the Hussite Wars, which are some of the most violent, um, uh, again, uh, religious wars in Europe up until the Reformation. Um, all I mean, of this is do, going... You do have that um, that ethnic friction in Bohemia as well, which we've covered. Yes. Now. I mean, you have the Czechs mm. and the Germans and that that obviously is, is not, not a good recipe. Um, could, could I just ask one quick question, Am? Because sure. um, um, you know, with, with what you're saying about Sigismund here and, and the troubles he had to deal with, you you make him out to sound like quite an admirable man. Um, and this portrait that you've used on the left here um, by Durer, I, I just thought it was fascinating because, if I'm not mistaken, it was actually part of a um, um, you know two a two piece work. And you have Sigismund on one side, and then on the other side. Um, and you can see Sigismund here, he's depicted with a sort of, you know, hunch, this slouched posture. He doesn't cut a very impressive figure. Um, he's actually contrasted with another painting by Durer, which depicts Charlemagne. And, you know, he's mm. tall and broad-shouldered and strong. And so clearly Durer is trying to make a sort of political point here about, you know, the degeneration of empire, perhaps. But um, um, why do you think Durer would have had such a hostile, a hostile view of Sigismund? To my mind, I think you have to look at Sigismund within the light of the context which Jura is doing this. Um, I would draw a lot of comparisons between Maximilian and to Sigismund, where Sigismund, to me, ended his career in failure. Maximilian succeeded. Sigismund wanted to reform the empire. He failed. Maximilian succeeded. Sigismund wanted to leave basically a legacy of dynastic empire through the acquisition of all his thrones. He failed. Maximilian succeeded. So to, to my mind, Sigismund is almost the anticipation of Jura's patron in the in the form of Maximilian, but also um, Sigismund is a he, he's basically the result of this attempt to appeal to a, a ruler in the style of Frederick Barbarossa, but failing to do so miserably. I mean, just to elaborate on uh, to elaborate on these failures, you know, on, on the one hand, you know, he creates the Order of the Dragon again to unite 
various royal houses against the Ottomans. Yet he also has to deal with the situation in Bohemia. You know, he's ruling over Hungary. He's not even ruling in the empire. His um, uh, Wittelsbach and um, uh, Brandenburger cousins are ruling, and he will only become king in 1411. But he is essentially having to deal with the situation in Bohemia because his brother is at the same time so incompetent. So dealing with all these um, fronts at the same time, he finally um, becomes you know, um, king of the Romans in 1411 and inherits Bohemia in 1419, after which you've essentially had 50 years of continuous rot in Bohemia. Not only have you had a complete collapse of royal power, but um, Sigismund is hated because he has taken such a strong stance against Jan Hus, and he has basically, you know, been one of the principal factors behind Jan Hus's execution in 1415. And this is another fascinating aspect of um, the Emperor Sigismund. Like Frederick II, like Frederick Barbarossa, Sigismund conceives of his role in a priestly fashion. He wants to unite the empire religiously as well as politically. And to do this, he is one of the instigating forces behind the Council of Constance, which will end the Great Western Schism. And just to have a little note, you know, going back to our Hundred Years War stream, because this is something we didn't mention here. Um, Sigismund was very fond of Henry V, um, because, you know, of course, France had, you know, under Philip IV, been very aggressively expanding into Flanders and into the Aralat, you know, essentially chipping away piece by piece at imperial authority. And then you had the massive slab of territory in the Dauphin region, which is handed over to France. And Sigismund is very, very conscious of his role. He wants to defend the Western boundary of the empire, even though he himself only controls a tiny little territory in Luxembourg on the West. So Agincourt comes as a great relief for him in two ways. On the one hand, it seriously weakens the power of the Valois monarchy. And on the other, it also weakens the cause of the Avignon papacy, because the Avignon papacy had been essentially supported by the kings of France ever since um, uh, Charles V the Wise. And yes, because and so the of, French... course, of course, the, the Germans took the side of the Italian pope. Yes, and so they took the chance of the Roman Pope. Just there, there was, of course, a Pisan Pope in addition to a Roman Pope. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yes, yeah. Roman Pope. Sorry. Oh, so, um, yes, in addition to all these things, uh, this is why, you know, you, you can look at Sigismund as, as quite an interesting figure because he is able to resolve the Western schism through looking at this within the you know greater political context and exploiting the weakness of France to force through the Council of Constance to have the recognition of the Roman pontiff as the supreme pontiff and all the other pontiffs as anti-popes, essentially, uh, thereby, you know, imposing the the, the the Roman, you know, resolving the schism on the side of Rome. So in this sense, again, I, I do see his role in this um, almost Ghibelline-esque fashion. Yet at the same time, he is inheriting this on the back of 200 years of rot. And he does not have the power, nor does he have the support in order to reverse this rot during his lifetime. And really, when you talk about the beginning of the restoration under the Habsburgs, you can say it really begins with Sigismund, because Sigismund is going to leave his patronage to the Habsburgs. I mean, just talk about the lack of support on, on the one hand and then contrast it with the Habsburgs later. Um, when his cousin uh, dies, the, the House of Brandenburg, um, you know, is basically left, left vacant, essentially. Um, Rather than you know take control of Brandenburg and therefore overstretch his domains even more, um, he gives the uh, Margravate of Brandenburg to what he thinks is an ally, which is the House of Hohenzollern. The House of Hohenzollern, who will later become kings of Prussia and later the emperors, uh, the emperors of Germany. Um, rather than, sorry, Panama. Oh no, I was just clearing my throat. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I do tend to ramble. <laughs> um, uh, Rather than support, um, it's, it's not a ramble. It's it's a leisurely walk to a lovely destination. Yes, throughout well, history. Well, well, thank you very much, both of you. Um, so, rather than helping, because uh, essentially, you know, what does Sigismund believe he's doing by this? He's basically setting up an ally with a power base who can intervene on the emperor's side whilst he tries to rescue the situation in Bohemia, which is collapsing from religious from a religious point of view and a political point of view. Because not only do you have the moderate Hussites who basically want, basically they're advocating for the power of the, the estates versus the king. Now you have the Taborites, which are- <laughs> Yeah, they're, 
they're they're another they're in another league. The Taborites. Yeah. Mm. Yes, the the Czech nationalists basically against the Osidlung combined with this um radical version of Hussitism, which is completely irredeemable to um any sort of collusion with the Catholic Church or imperial authority at the same time. Yeah. So it's Old Testament rage. Yes. So all of these elements are conspiring against Sigismund. Sigismund appeals to his new created allies in the Margarita Brandenburg. And what does the Margrave of Brandenburg do? He supports the rebels against Sigismund because he has no interest in creating a powerful Holy Roman Emperor. So he is he's completely betrayed. And when you look at his imperial reforms, he, he he's fighting this, you know, fighting all of these fronts at the same time. Only in 1433, towards the end of his life, when he's in his 60s, is he finally crowned as the Holy Roman Emperor, and he immediately sets upon a process of reform. He convokes two um, Reichstags or imperial diets, uh, one at Eger in 1434 and one at Nuremberg in 1438. And among his proposals are the secularization of church lands, basically to increase taxes and also levies for um, defending the, the boundaries of the empire, um, creating an eternal peace by banning you know, blood feuds, essentially, as justification of conflict between all of the imperial vassals. Essentially, he's trying to stop the Holy Roman Empire from constantly being at war with each other. And also, this also involves the reorganization of the imperial territories. And this, these ideas, of course, all fail. Nevertheless, um, they have they leave an indelible mark on German thinking hereafter um, in what is later called the Reformatio Sigismundi. Um, these ideas being circulated where essentially a lot of um, academic groups at the time, uh, journals publishing, advocating for basically reviving the legacy of this uh, failed attempt to reform. And this is later going to be seized on by Maximilian uh, towards the, the end of the time period we're talking about. So, so um, this so this painting then is really just a sort of boast on behalf of Maximilian. <laughs> you know, look look what this uh, look what this little man can do that I could. <laughs> Even emperors um, can be petty. There's some something I did want to bring up with Sigismund is that um, I was reading some papal history recently, and his name comes up uh, over something called the um, Placitum Regium, um, where he he decrees that papal bulls are basically, I believe, not valid within Hungary without the consent yeah. of the king. Um, now, I understand, as we kind of covered, there was some trouble with the uh, papacy and the church in this time. Um, but outside of that, I mean, how how radical of a suggestion was this? How how kind of, uh, you know, was, was, was this something that would have been co controversial or... Or generally accepted well columba and i that, that, that's an interesting point thank you panama um columba and i have been talking in our previous situation about the rise of gallicanism in france corresponding with the reign of um louis the 11th how louis the 11th wanted not not only to have you know autonomy from rome but he also wanted to appoint bishops essentially without having to go through um uh, papal approval or even papal confirmation and this process mm. is going to be um, extended until we have the reign of um, Francis I at the beginning of the 16th century. To my mind um, what these proposals essentially are is that Sigismund is having to balance the interests of his nobility which in Hungary are very powerful against the interests of the papacy. Now in attempting to basically prevent what you can see is the arbitrary use of papal power across all of Christendom, he is trying to create some sort of synergy whereby if the approve, if basically the Pope's um, measures meet with the approval of the King, they could be seen as doubly legitimate whenever they're introduced, mm -hmm. as opposed to the King genuinely trying to resist papal authority. Nevertheless, there is that aspect with Sigismund, which, which, which is important to bear, that he does, I think, view himself within this Ghibelline conception where he has both temporal and spiritual power and that the Pope should pay heed to him, essentially. And I mean, there are, there are many sort of um, radical proposals. I mean, one of the um, posthumous claims which will later be attributed to him in the uh, Reformatio Sigismundi is that of ending clerical celibacy which of course is a incredibly controversial view which will later be taken upon by the Reformation. But if that were true and he were advocating for that position, it does show that he is thinking of religious reform um, using his power as emperor, not yeah. you know circumvented in any way by the Pope. So it's I mean, interesting you... and... No, no, finish, finish your point now. 
sorry, it's an interesting and complicated question, but due to the failure and the political limitations of Sigismund, uh, we can't really see what the result of his policies would have been had he had the power to actually Im implement them. Yes, it's essentially a sort of a, a massive game of spinning plates. And, and you do see some, you know, as a result of this very febrile situation where the Hungarians are trying to assert their control, the Bohemians are trying to assert their control as well. Um, you, see, you see a lot of things happening which are very surprising. I, I mean, you know, slightly later when um, when Ladislaus and there's the controversy around his, his accession to the throne, um, the Hungarians um, um, refuse his crowning. Um, and they put out a proclamation saying that the king cannot be crowned um, um, without the consent of the people, because the consent of the people is the wellspring from which sovereignty comes. And so you see these arguments that you that, um, um, look a tad out of place, uh, and you'd think would come a bit later. But in Hungary and um, and, and in um, in the holdings of the Habsburgs at this time, you see all of these very sort of um, um, foreboding problems, I suppose, that you see I much think... later all over the place. Regarding that point about Hungary, um, to my mind, it was less the people as conceived of as equal and the people as conceived of as the magnates of the realm. <laughs> well, yes, yes, it's um, angry nobles, but that's their excuse, you know, which is still. Well, to be, to be fair to the Hungarian nobility, um, this is just after the Crusade of Varna. Hungary is imperiled, and the Hungarian, sorry, just before the Crusade of Varna, sorry, and the Hungarians want a king. And they want a king who can lead men into battle. They don't want a child, essentially, who could die at any moment and plunge the kingdom into even more crisis, in, into an even greater crisis, essentially. So there is that um, con yeah, there the is that concept the of Turks national survival. Being for blood in the east. Yeah. Always bear in mind that the Turks are always nipping around the um, the boundaries of Hungary. Um, so yes, just to just to finish this point and bring this back to to Albert, this figure on the on the right here is known to posterity as Albert the Magnanimous. Um, in contrast to the traitorous um, Hohenzollerns, uh, the Habsburgs are very loyal allies to Sigismund. Uh, so loyal that in 1422, um, Albert is awarded um, the only the only child of um, Sigismund Elizabeth as a bride. And this essentially, in addition to cementing the alliance, it creates, it basically says that the whole patrimony of the House of Luxembourg, who at one point had been arch rivals of the Habsburgs and at one point had tried to basically disinherit them through the Golden Bull. Now, ironically, the House of Luxembourg, it's putting its faith on its legacy being continued through the, the House of Habsburg. And this is actually a clever decision by Sigismund because Albert is a loyal vassal, even though from a military point of view, um, his uh, influence isn't decisive. And in fact, he loses. He loses a very famous battle at the Battle of Taos um, against the Hussites. Nevertheless, you could say it's this this one um, shy, this one sort of um, uh, ray of hope, essentially, um, regarding him not having been abandoned by all of his normal German vassals, even if he literally has to bequeath his entire patronage to them in the end. Um, so by 1437, um, you know, Sigismund you know, finally dies. But despite the fact that we've been talking about how his political authority was incredibly weak, um, you can say the actual prestige and the respect for Sigismund was such that Albert was elected as per the wishes of Sigismund without contestation. And as we saw throughout, you know, the reigns of Louis IV, the Bavarian and the, pre and the preceding um, rulers during the Great Interregnum, um, whenever you had the election of a new king of the Romans, it always, always led to a civil war. So you can say Sigismund was ultimately successful and that he was able to allow for a smooth transition of power to the House of Habsburg. But of course, uh, there was another little complication which gets in the way, which, which of course that Albert dies only two years <laughs> yeah, after. a lot of short-lived Habsburgs at this time I don't know yes. I don't know what they were doing <laughs> well in this case I'm um, fighting against the again fighting against the Turks and trying to uh, solidify the boundary in Hungary um so this 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 new this new this new hope of the um of the Empire the consolidation of Bohemia Hungary and Austria uh, under the Habsburgs and of course the Imperial position only lasts two years before all of this is um uh, thrown into disarray, which is when we get to the the rise, the real rise of the Habsburgs, not another one of these um, uh, false starts, uh, so to speak. We've had two of them now, uh, which involves the the conflict between Frederick the Third and Ladislaus. Now. Frederick is a scion of the other branch of the family. Albert is one of the Albertine um, members of the family from Austria proper around Vienna. Um, 
Frederick inherits in Austria um, only a contingent of the Leopoldian uh, patrimony, because of course, further Austria, including Tyrol, uh, was held by his uncle, uh, wonderfully called Frederick of the Empty Pockets, <laughs> and ultimately would be succeeded by his um, by his son Sigismund. And as is the case with you know so many Habsburg rulers, he inherits at a very young age. He inherits at the age of nine. He also inherits alongside his brother Albert, who is his co-ruler, to make things more complicated. And he is placed under the regency of um, uh, of Albert, later and um, later King Albert, um, but there's something very curious about um, Frederick as as pertains to his ambitions. You know, he is derided as the arch sleepyhead of the Holy Roman Empire in terms of his complete incompetence when it comes to military affairs. Yet I see in him a figure which is very similar to almost you know contemporaneous or in fact he is contemporaneous with uh, Louis XI from France, which is a Machiavellian ruler who is able to outwit and out basically pace his opposition through patience and subtlety rather than through brute military strength. And just to indicate his ambition, in 1435, even when he was only controlling one part of the Austrian lands, you know, Albert V in every way overshadowed him as the heir apparent to the whole imperial legacy. Um, he adopts a very curious motto at the beginning, which is um, A-E-I-O-U, and there's subsequently been, I think, over a hundred Latin translations of what that could possibly mean. And the reference we actually have is from a diary which was supposed to be connected to him, which was discovered in the 17th century, which has a German translation and a Latin translation the German translation is Alles Ederreich ist Österreich untertan, and the Latin translation is Austria est imperiale orbi universal. And both of these basically mean all the world is subject to Austria. Um, weirdly, you know, he has no claim, no right to make that claim um, in 1435. Absolutely no right to make that claim. And yet that would be Wonder, a wonderful bit of foreshadowing for what would happen over the next hundred years, because within a hundred years from 1435 until 1535, um, he will control this tiny little patrimony of Austria and the domains of the House of Austria will engorge to include essentially half of Europe. So I, I'm not sure what is necessarily going on there, but it's some very prescient for what later happens. Well, I mean, never mind just half of Europe, I mean, <laughs> the Americas as well. <laughs> yes, they, quite, they established the acquisition. <laughs> Charles V establishes the first empire upon which the sun never set, so to speak. So he was the first um, universal ruler and world ruler, but you know Charles yeah. V is going to be a subject for his own stream because he's. Um, I think he, he has to be. Yeah. He has to be really, um, but again, all of this is more complicated. So in 1439, we have the the death of Albert, and we have the death of Frederick of Further Austria. Now it would appear that this has been a wonderful stroke of luck among many many strokes of luck for Frederick III, because now he is in theory the heir potentially to Austria proper and he is now the regent of further Austria and then as a sort of a miracle the Habsburg um, Elizabeth of Luxembourg who is the wife of Albert is pregnant and she produces a posthumous king uh, Ladislaus the posthumous um, and just to put this in reference of timing um, Frederick is elected as the king of the Romans in on the 2nd of February, 1440. Ladislaus is born on the 22nd of February, 1440. So only by a matter of three weeks does Frederick III actually get his election as holy, as um, the basically the would-be Holy Roman Emperor without having to contest it with the, the son of Albert, who arguably has a much better claim to it than he does, simply as the mere cousin of Albert. And that is the basis upon which he is elected as King of the Romans. Again, um, uh, unanimously, as a result of the prestige afforded to him by Albert and by Sigismund. And of course, this leads to you know, a, a serious complication because not only is um, Ladislaus a potential claimant to the Holy Roman Empire, but he is also a, a claimant to the King of Bohemia and the King of Hungary and the richest part of Austria at the same time. So Frederick III responds to this by locking up Frederick and locking up Ladislaus, uh, sorry, Sigismund and locking up Ladislaus. Essentially, he is going to keep them as hostages so he can hold on to their territories for as long as possible. And this way, possibly, 
he can um you know control austria basically by um by this ridiculous uh, system of basically being being the, being the prison warden of his state um mm. to the extent that you know he's terrified about um ladislaus breaking free and there being a rebellion back in austria so when he makes his procession into italy to be crowned as the first holy roman emperor of the house of habsburg um he takes ladislaus basically as a pet <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> along with him <laughs> uh, to prevent I, him escaping um... yeah I, I just had to go away there for a little minute, but I don't know. Did you cover um, um, Ladislaw's birth and the sort of story around it with his mother? Because it's a great story. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. So um, Ladislaus is famously named Ladislaw the, the Posthumous because he was born after his father died. Um, his father died, um, I think, preparing for a campaign against the Turks. And um, his mother, because um, essentially he's elected and the, the Austrians... Um, the, the Austrian magnates accept his accept his rule. Um, the German magnates in Bohemia accept his rule, um, but the Hungarians, for the mention for the reasons that you mentioned, they're threatened by the Turks. They don't want a, a baby. They don't want a boy king, and so they they, they refuse. Um, I, and essentially, the Hungarians go to Vladislav um, of Poland, the king of Poland at the time, um, and, and invite him to take the crown. Um, they want they want him because he's 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 um he's older and and Poland's got a solid army behind it. And so essentially the Hungarian magnates try and get Elizabeth of Luxembourg, uh, Ladislav's mother, to marry Vladislav. Um, and and uh, Elizabeth is like 31 at the time, 32. And uh, this boy Vladislav is 16. Um, and so she's she's really not not happy about this prospect at all. But she plays and along pregnant for a, at the same time. Yeah, yes, and pregnant, of course. Um, and so she plays along with this for a little while, makes a show of accepting. Um, but in the meantime, her doctors... Um, you know, I don't know how exactly, um, they, they've made a prediction to her that the child is going to be a son. Her child is going to be a son. And so, um, and, and indeed, um, Albert had left provision in his will that if the child is a son, then he will get the Austrian lands, he will get the Hungarian lands, um, and he will get the Bohemian lands. And so Elizabeth wants to honor this, and she wants this for her son, naturally. <laughs> and so what she does is she orders one of her chambermaids, a woman called um, Helena uh, Kotaner, um, um, one of her chambermaids to steal into Visegrad Castle and make away with the holy, um, the crown jewels of Hungary, essentially. Um, and this chamber, this chambermaid pulls it off. She manages to take the ancient crown and gets it back to Elizabeth on the day that she goes into labor and gives birth to Ladislav. And so they all take it as an omen. Um, and then eventually, um, um, they, they they take up they force so they have the baby Ladislav uh, take the oath um, or they read the oath to him and apparently the second they started reading the oath he started loudly bawling in the cathedral as well um, but I just thought it was a very evocative story very interesting yes I, I, and thank you thank you for um, for telling us that Columba I think the you know the effect of this is that you would you would think that was you know, portentous for a for a glorious reign and yet it proves to be another one of these Habsburg false starts. Um, <laughs> yes, indeed. Ultimately, because yes, you, you mentioned he inherits the his father's duchy of Austria. He inherits Hungary. He inherits Bohemia. And he can rightfully contest his father's legitimacy as the King of the Romans and later Holy Roman Emperor. Um, but, you know, essentially more than that, he has to deal with all of these crises which have been caused you know, in the preceding century. So Hungary has an incredibly powerful nobility which is anxious just to allow the idea of you know, primogeniture or succession through through right of inheritance to be established. The nobles want to maintain their right to elect a king of their choosing. Whilst in Bohemia, um, the country is basically controlled by a series of factions, one, you know, basically Catholic Unionists or moderate Hussites, many of the towns are comprised of Taborites. So unlike in Hungary, where they quickly elect a king who then subsequently gets killed at the Battle of Varna, um, Bohemia just sort of lapses into complete anarchy uh, during a very long interregnum from 1439 until he's finally crowned in 1453. Um, and of course, during this time in Hungary, after the, um, after the death of um, uh, Vladislav, um, the Hungarians beseech um, Frederick to let that let them have their king back, essentially, because he's still being kept as a prisoner in um, in Vienna, and um, Frederick the Third has no intention of allowing Frederick to go to go, because essentially by controlling Frederick, 
he is able to not only control uh, Austria, but he's able to exert influence on Bohemia and on Hungary. So instead, we come to this odd situation where one of the heroes of the, the war against um, the Turks, John Hunyadi, um, is anointed regent, basically as a result of the acceptance of Frederick. And Frederick is going to hang on to Ladislaus for as long as it possible, whilst, you know, essentially, you know, he has no, Frederick has no desire to go and conquer Hungary by force um, under the name of his, uh, under the name of his, um, of his cousin. You know, he's simply going to hold him as a political prop and basically holds on to him until a coalition of nobles in Upper Austria, led by um, Ulrich of Selje, um, force him upon reaching the Austrian age of majority, in this case it's 12, because um, Frederick had basically claimed that, um, oh, in Hungary, the age of majority is different. So I'm going to hold him for that little bit longer. <laughs> but <of> course... <laughs> Naturally. Amazing. So, um, of course, that fails. You know, he, he's basically faced with the option of civil war or release the boy, and he releases the boy. And then the boy goes off. And he's you know only 13 and he is crowned as um king of bohemia he's crowned as king of hungary he's crowned of croatia and during his very short reign from 1453 to 1457 he is again desperately trying to form some sort of power as a result of you know um the the advice that he's given at the expense of all of these you know um contrivances of the estates to hold on to their own privileges and all of this potential is again wiped out by another premature death when it seems now that we know he died of bubonic um, plague even though many people at the time believed he was poisoned because of course that worked out very well for the um for the ability at that time and it worked out very well for one matthias corvinus who was the son of john huyadi and would later become king of hungary in his own right and become essentially the charles the bold to um uh, the equivalent of charles the bold to frederick III as have been, that's fascinating the way, just thinking about it, referring back to our stream on Burgundy. Yeah, I was going to, it's we, a very apt comparison, because I mean, he, he as well, didn't, um, didn't, um, Matthias Corvinus, didn't he take Vienna? We talked about that, but yes. he, he didn't, he didn't manage to consolidate his gains, you know, a very yes. able leader militarily, but couldn't consolidate. Yes, we see, mm. we see a very, <clears throat> very competent, probably one of the most competent kings of Hungary ever, who, like Charles the Bold, is attempting to solidify it, centralize his reign, establish a professional army. In the case of Matthias Corvinus, this is the Black Army. And again, trying to impose his claims not only over Hungary, but over Bohemia and as an extension Austria as well. He basically conquers Austria as an afterthought because the Austrians has been supporting the um, uh, the faction of uh, George Pod Podibradi, who had been basically a moderate Hussite who had um, been made king, I think, in the late 1450s. Um, for his, as, and you know, Matthias Corvinus conceived of this attack on the Hussite king of Bohemia as a holy crusade. And he basically believed that the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick III was contriving and basically allying with heretics. So he believed he was more than justified in attacking Austria. And so from 1468 until 1490, there was this very long rivalry between Frederick and Matthias Corvinus. And Matthias Corvinus wins completely militarily. Um, he doesn't go as far as to take over the city of Prague, but he occupies Silesia, he occupies Moravia, and he occupies um, virtually the entire eastern part of Austria, including Vienna. And Frederick III has to go through the indignity of changing his capital every year to avoid being captured by Matthias Corvinus. You know, he, he goes he goes from Vienna, he goes to he goes to um, Graz and eventually goes to Linz, which is um, in the Austrian interior to avoid being captured. But mm. one of the one of the constant themes with Frederick III is miraculously he manages to outlive all of his opponents. Mm. <laughs> That's how he eventually wins. Get uh, lucky. Through, through no... It must have been. It must have been all the exercise from running. I mean, away. Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kept him fit. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it's, it's astonishing in a way because, you know, um, Matthias Corvinus dies and like we see with the situation with Charles the Bold, um, the, the Hunyadi uh, Corvinus dynasty dies with him, essentially, and Hungary devolves into being basically a, a powder keg of, you know, monarchical versus um, uh, noble influence. So this idea of um, a centralized, powerful Hungary is a one off and it doesn't um, repeat itself, you can argue, ever after Matthias Corvinus. Um, so. Uh, just just to refer to this, Frederick was 74 in 1490 and Matthias Corvinus was only 47. And yet he keeps 
miraculously managing again to outlive all of his rivals and of course another rival who he was militarily in conflict with and again defeated by outliving him was his own brother albert the sixth albert the sixth had obviously been made co-ruler along with his brother uh, you know at, at the beginning of his reign and from you know 1457 to 1467 albert had been uh, very much pushing to have some sort of right, some sort of territory bestowed on to, uh, upon him. But of course, if you can point to any sort of goal uh, that Frederick III was focused on, it was the consolidation of all the Austrian lands under his rule, um, far more so than any you know idea that he wanted to actually rule effectively as a Holy Roman Emperor. He had no interest in imperial reform. He had no interest in defending any of the other you know imperial possessions. He was almost solely focused on the idea of uniting Austria. And of course, his brother, was to be denied his claim of ruling his own independent duchy. Um, Rudolf, sorry, Frederick III had learnt from the mistake of Rudolf IV. He wasn't going to share power. And conveniently, despite um, Albert being far more successful militarily than his brother, um, Albert, of course, dies prematurely in 1467, <laughs> therefore giving Frederick, you know, the entire the entire control of Austria, with the exception of his cousin Sigismund, who was basically bought out in 1490. And there we have it, the, the unification of Austria by the arch sleepy head of the Holy Roman Empire by outliving um, all of his more, more courageous it's opponents. A, it's, a slow, it's a slow start, but the Habsburgs are finally, you know, they're on their way now. <laughs> they had us in the first half. Yeah, they're on um, their way. Did his brother did his brother happen to die in, you know, a hunting accident or something? <laughs> or, oh, or was uh, it no? <laughs> I don't know, but I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised um, yes. if that is the case. So um, yes, after this uh, deplorable um, legacy of um, of martial glory, which has been afforded by um, Frederick III, now we get to the the glorious consolidation, and this is where I want to refer back to that quote, which I, I use at the same time. I might as well use the Latin: uh, "Bella galant alii tu Felix Austria nubi." Let others wage war, but you, happy Austria, shall marry. And of course, there's another component of that. Nam qua Mars alias dat tibi regna Venus. For those kingdoms which Mars gives to others, Venus gives to thee. And that is, of course, the motto of Maximilian. And it is a wonderful summary of how effective his policy was, because all of the major marriages which are going to create the Habsburg Empire of his two sons, of his two grandsons rather, uh, Charles and Ferdinand, are going to basically be accomplished during the, um, the the reign of Maximilian. And of course, Maximilian is not, not just, you know, waiting for control of Austria. In 1477, um, continuing on nicely from our Burgundy stream, uh, he goes off and after having been in conflict essentially with Charles the Bold of Burgundy, um, the estate in uh, the estates of um, the, ne the, 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 the Netherlands or Flanders of the city of Ghent, they invite Maximilian to marry Mary of Burgundy because the estates are terrified that Louis XI for France is going to conquer us. He's going to reclaim uh, Flanders. He's going to invade the Low Countries. And as we've seen, Frederick III is militarily incompetent. And there is no way we can rely on him to personally defend the empire's borders in the West. So they rely on this other Habsburg prince, Maximilian, the son of Frederick, to come in and to defend the, the boundaries of the Low Countries against the encroachments of France, because Louis, you could say in hindsight, he believed this was his worst mistake, um, exploited the military defeat of Charles the Bald by taking over his possessions by false and imposing basically the reversion of the crown, when in reality, he believed later, on, on near, near his deathbed in the, um, the early 1480s, that he should have instead gone for the marriage proposal with Mary of Burgundy. Of course, that didn't happen. Maximilian sweeps in there, and in 1477, marries the richest heiress in Europe, of course she is known as Mary the Rich, and he does what he was supposed to. He wins the Battle of Kunigat in 1479 against the forces of Louis XI, and as a result of that, Louis XI is unable to advance. But I draw your attention back to that previous stream where the Dutch have their own version of the Magna Carta, or the Great Privilege, um, where essentially the Netherlands are granted all of these particularistic powers to hold their leader accountable. They don't want another tyrant. They don't want another Charles the Bald who is going to impose centralizing institutions, vast taxation, and he's going to periodically try and wipe out cities that oppose him, such as the city of Liège. So the Dutch estates do something which is remarkable here, which is that after Maximilian wins his great victory at the Battle of Kunigat, halting Louis' advance, um, they then refuse to fund him any longer. 
they basically disband his army and say, you've defended the lands. You know, if the French invade, you know, come back, we'll fund you again. But until then, we don't want to give you a prop that will be used against us, essentially. And this is the the issue which Maximilian is confronted with, which is that the, the estates very much see themselves as autonomous. They see him basically as the sword behind their sovereign, who is, of course, some um, Mary, Duchess of Burgundy. And unfortunately, as we elucidated in our previous stream, Mary dies um, very young. She is thrown from her horse in 1482. And rather than Maximilian taking the throne um, on her behalf, the throne is inherited by their very young son, Philip the Handsome, so as to distinguish him from his um, infamous um, French counterpart, Philip the Fair. <laughs> um, <laughs> is, is there anything either of you want to comment on um, my, my, my ramble so far? Um, I, I, I'm so, so Maximilian was the son of Frederick. Yes. 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 Okay. That's, that's, that's all I was looking at. Um, no, I mean, I mean, I, I'm in a bit of a, I'm in a bit of a bother because I was sort of consolidating my notes, um, to prepare for this. And then I found out that I had to come on an hour earlier than usual. And so my uh, max, my Maximilian knowledge isn't, isn't as good as it could be, I'm afraid. Yes. Well, well the reason we're on an hour earlier is that, um, Radlib, of course, starts his stream in, um, uh, about yeah, half yeah. an hour so trying to avoid <laughs> overlap as we've had to um change the last minute i, I, I see um, we're already getting um sorry i was just going to say quickly i see that we're already getting um um the results of this policy of marriage judging by the central portrait here especially oh, yes. the boy in the middle yeah oh, yes that, that is of course the the infamous habsburg jaw which is going to yes. become more well, this is the habsburg jaw at the beginning <laughs> You'll have to um, see the the culmination of this um, marriage policy when we get to Charles. I believe. Spain. I believe you mean the Chad Jaw. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, the Chadbergs. Yes. Um, I, I mean, Maximilian is one of the more famous uh, Roman emperors, uh, Holy Roman emperors, um, particularly from this period. And I know that um, uh, von Rank uh, uh, loved to talk about him, um, though he, though again, kind of. I think half the the German historians kind of love him, and half of them seem to hate him. Um, I think von Ranke has, I would say, an unfair um, uh, unfair criticism of him, which is that um, he believed that Maximilian focused too much on dynastic affairs rather than imperial affairs. Um, what I'll try and do is explain that he actually did both rather masterfully. I, I actually rather love Maximilian, as we'll, as we'll, as we'll explain. Um, he looks like a crafty old fox as well. Yes, well, he's a crafty old fox, but he has many endearing qualities which are completely absent in his father. So, you know, first of all, you know, he comes back and he's he's a, he's a war hero. He defends his inheritance of his wife and therefore solidifies it for the House of Habsburg. Then he comes back and he's the one leading the reconquest of Austria after the death of Matthias Corvinus. And again, just to show the contrast between Maximilian and his father, um, Maximilian, you know, after having taken Austria, believes, oh, well, you know, um, the Hungarians are now in a state of disarray. Uh, the nobles are rebelling against royal authority. Let's go further. Let's um, claim the the vestige of, you know, Habsburg sort of patrimony we can um, from the legacy of Ladislaus and Albert. Um, in response to that, uh, Frederick actually cuts off his own son from funding to prevent him going any further. <laughs> Um, one can argue that that's um, sheer sort of fiscal prudence and that he doesn't want his son to be an adventurer. But I think it also shows that um, Maximilian is far more ambitious than his father and he's prepared to prosecute and defend all of his claims. Whereas Frederick was, despite the grand um, ostentation of his um, famous motto, uh, was very much focused on the rule in Austria. And in terms of, again, looking at the, I would say, the, the scale of Maximilian's ambition, um, in 1490, as we mentioned, he is able to secure the inheritance of Tyrol from the um, from Sigismund, the Archduke of Further Austria. And as the Count of Tyrol, which is, you know, his first claim in Austria proper, because his father will rule for another three years, um, Tyrol had basically been this no man's land, this um, basically conflict zone between the Austrians and the Swiss. And under Maximilian, he puts an end basically to um, the War of the Barons. He establishes legal institutions and financial reforms. Um, he establishes, you know, a major sort of architectural presence in Innsbruck. You know, for example, the the great golden roof in Innsbruck, the the Hofkirche in um, in Innsbruck as well. He basically models Innsbruck as you know, you can almost say a demonstration of Habsburg power. 
Mm. Um, and more than that, you know, of course, this is from his point of view, uh, an incredibly fortuitous position that he decides to focus so much of his original energy on to roll because, you know, he had ruled as um, a basically regent for his son, who was the real Duke of Burgundy. So to roll is actually one of the first possessions which he holds in his own right. And he goes about it, you know, in an incredibly sort of enthusiastic way. And of course, one of the figures he patronizes is Jacob Fugger, one of the um, the great bankers of Augsburg. And the Fuggers from this point on um, become the major banking family for the Habsburgs and they fund many of the very expensive not only military adventures of um, Maximilian but cultural adventures as well and of course at the same time so we're talking you know 1493 on 1493 onwards uh Tyrol becomes the center of some of the largest um uh, silver op silver mining operations in Europe essentially it resolves the great bullion crisis before you have the then other great importation of silver, so much so it causes the devaluation of silver when the um, Spanish uh, conquer vast parts of the New World. Yes, I was I was going to say because you, you mentioned the um, uh, currency problem earlier, um, but of course this is I mean this reign is uh, around the 1490s, isn't it? So it's not long until uh, the Spanish will, will begin their ex exploration and conquest, is it? Yes, um, the Spanish will discover the new world under the patronage of Isabella and Ferdinand in 1492. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, the Portuguese had, under Henry the Navigator, had been exploring, you know, long before then, around 50 years before then. But um, Columbus, of course, discovered the new world and, you know, established, you know, a Spanish sort of pre-presence on the island of Hispaniola. Yes. And of course, the Spanish will move from Hispaniola, they'll move into Colombia, they'll move into Cuba. And from the beginning of the 16th century, they will then, you know, go off and they will conquer uh, the Aztec um, Kingdom yeah. Montezuma. And then, of course, they will move on and they will conquer the Incan Empire yeah. in, 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 in Peru and Bolivia. So, so yes, this is the beginning of all that. Um, I would save... I, I read... About that. Um... No, I was just going to say I read something remarkable um, um, with regards to that, you know, and, and the vast, the vast quantities of gold and silver that were coming back into the Habsburg coffers. And it's actually um, a description from Albrecht Kudura. Um, he went to, I think it might have been the, the court of Maximilian. These things were brought back. I can't remember exactly. It might have been a bit later. But he describes, um, essentially, you had the, the Aztec and the Mayan, the long count calendars. If you've ever seen one, it's a sort of, massive stone disc essentially um, yes well yes but well not all of them were in stone um it's just that the only ones that survive now are stone but durer actually describes remarkably and he describes them as a sun and a moon because he didn't really know that it was a calendar essentially they had no knowledge of the system um he describes i think it's um a 12 foot wide solid gold disc a sun disc which is one of these calendars I and mean, there was a solid gold one 12 feet long and there was a solid silver one 12 feet long and so you can just Im imagine the amount of wealth that's being brought back and you know um stuff like this was absolutely electrifying for the um um the metal workers and the men in augsburg and nuremberg i mean i mean durer himself says he comments you know the men who make these things must be incredibly talented you know these must not be um um savages like the other indians that we've discovered you know you know up until now um and so there's just this amazing um um shock of this wealth being brought back um, and of course you know um <laughs> It, all of this stuff is melted down almost immediately to turn into coins and ingots, yes. and none of it survives. <laughs> and we can weep for civilization, sadly, but of course, yes. we have we have to. Well, move on. you um, know, listen, shiny, you, rip, shiny. You, you rip children's hearts out, we're gonna steal your stuff, okay? <laughs> I think that's a fair deal in my book. <laughs> mm. So, yes, uh, the, Tying this um, back to Sigismund um, and the Reformatio Sigismundi, um, from 1495, Maximilian does what Frederick III had no interest in ever doing, which was in appearing to be a ruler of the entire Holy Roman Empire and dealing with the fundamental mess that the empire had been left in since the decline of the Hohenstaufens. And the golden bull, rather than resolving these issues, rather was an affirmation of this decline and almost legalization of anarchy. So in 1495, Frederick, uh, um, Maximilian convokes another um, Reichstag in Worms. 
And ju just to, again, illustrate the need of this, um, there was now a general anxiety within the entire Holy Roman Empire because France had just expanded and taken over um, you know, you know the, the, the large part of the Burgundian patrimony. It had consolidated and was now a centralized state. And it was now beginning to wage its war against the, um, the Aragona family in Italy at the same time. This is the beginning of the Italian wars, which we'll touch on next stream. Um, so the Germans are terrified that basically the imperial possessions being as disunited as they are, are incredibly vulnerable to attack from a strong and consolidated France. And of course, you know, we referenced this again back to Sigismund earlier. He had attempted to reform the empire, failed, and he had aligned himself with the English because he understood the potential power of a united France. And of course, by the end of his reign, so Sigismund died in 1437, uh, France had basically won the Hundred Years War by that point. You know, the so English would you, people... so it's partially that sort of terror of this new, I mean, you, we talked about the professional army that Charles built yes. as well. It's that yes. fear of this consolidated France that pushes the nobles into the arms of Max. But more so than that's that, really more so, that's just one aspect of it, because the Habsburgs are, that's just on the Western Front. Um, the Habsburgs themselves are also have a vested interest in doing this, because you know under Sigismund, this wasn't so much of an issue, but under Maximilian, he now holds vast rich land on the boundary of France at the same time. So it's in the interest of the empire and in the interest of the House of Habsburg to pursue an aggressively anti-French policy in line with what the, the, you know, the princes of the empire want. And of course, you have then have arguably the even greater threat in the East, which is that Sigismund also tried to deal with the aggressiveness of the Ottomans. He dies in 1437. In 1453, the Ottomans take over Constantinople and they take over Albania, they take over Serbia, they attack Venice, um, they consolidate their rule over Wallachia. Um, and of course, they will go for Hungary and they will defeat Hungary decisively in 1526. So the consolidate, and of course, on the northeastern front, you have the rise of the Jugelion dynasty. Uh, during this time, uh, the House of Jugelion controlled Poland, they controlled Bohemia, they controlled Hungary, uh, they controlled Lithuania. Um, so all of these powers are beginning to surround the Holy Roman Empire, and there is a desperate need of the princes to try and form some sort of consolidation. But also, that's just the enemy without. You also have to deal with the fact that there is random feuding, random violence throughout the entire empire. So there is this desperate need to go for a perpetual peace, essentially, to establish some form of um, stability in the empire. And of course, you know, one of the, the other aspects that Maximilian introduces is trying to improve in infrastructure following the model of Louis XI in France. He establishes a postal network. So all of these things, again, modeled on what's taken, taken in France, you could say ultimately happens with the Holy Roman Empire, but much later. So we mentioned in our stream on the Hundred Years' War, that you have the you know the, the creation of an efficient machinery of government such as the paris parliament or you know in england under edward the first the the model parliament so to speak so the institutions like the reichstag the reichstag has a much older history than the paris parliament or the english parliament much older it goes back to the you know the diets of ancient germany essentially all the things of ancient germany um the the ancient sort of um councils of the of the note of the warrior sort of aristocracy essentially and then um of course you have similar institutions which appear in Merov in the merovingian times and in the carolingian times yes yeah, so it's a sort of legacy of that that germanic you know elective tribal tradition yeah it goes back you know into the prehistoric period. But despite that, you know, tradition, uh, the German Reichstag, or rather the Imperial Reichstag, again, Reichstag, Imperial Diet, um, had, you know, was far less advanced than that of um, France and that of England. And again, what is the point of these institutions? Uh, this is not part of some democratic teleology, which is going to result in the triumph of parliamentarianism over monarchy, no. A parliament is there to provide a machinery for legislation, um, machinery for the courts, and it is there to facilitate feudal due, i.e. the right, basically the estates raising taxes for the for their liege, for their king, for their emperor to wage wars. The, this idea of concordance between all of the institutions under service of the of the sovereign, in this case, the emperor. And this is exactly the line of thinking which is advocated by uh, von Kuss, who is the you know, basically the leading reformer, theologian and advisor to Maximilian. So 
rather again against the idea of the idea of um the great anarchy essentially the golden bull of 1356 uh this proposal is made explicit in the fact that maximilian wants to introduce the common penny imperial taxes to be raised by the reichstag in the event of war he wants to establish a reichskammergericht a chamber of a, essentially a Paris Parliament equivalent, a Supreme Court under which the emperor is seen as the supreme source of justice. And of course, within the French legal tradition, we see this going all the way back to Saint Louis with Louis the Ninth. So essentially what the Holy Roman Empire under Maximilian is trying to do is catch up with all of these constitutional mm. developments, which have already been ongoing um, in an accelerated fashion throughout the rest of Europe. And they're modeling themselves on these institutions. Another um, uh, effective you know, pr uh, proposal of this is to try and make some sort of um, order out of all these incredibly uh, dis dislocated, decentralized uh, principalities, the result of the collapse of central authority during the Great Interregnum. So, you know, we originally had the great stem duchies. The stem duchies were, you know, based on the old tribal affiliations. You had the Bavarians, you had the Franconians, you had the Saxons, you had the Swabians, etc. Um, a, sim a system similar to that is created in the form of the so-called imperial circle. Um, these imperial circles are basically, you know, all of these princes shall be united under a, a grouping, essentially, an imperial circle, which is there to organize taxes. It's there to organize common defense whenever they are attacked. And it's also there to provide a form of formal representation of these, you know, free cities, of these ecclesiastical domains, of the nobility in these new formalized institutions of the Reichstag and the Reichskammergericht. Um, so, so if you can't get rid of these older things, just lay something else yes, on Yes, exactly. Them, try and consolidate yeah. them. Try, try and, did, all, did try he and also, reorganize um, them. Did he also um, sort of try and inculcate a sort of bureaucracy or sort of, um, you know, you use people from the middle class to sort of try yes, and this circumvent is, these older associations? This is, this, this is the, the imperial government. The, the, the difficulty is, again, in looking at this, is that this is still done in a very much decentralized fashion. We are not seeing the beginning of a centralized government. What we're trying to do is organize um, autonomous regions into some sort of cohesive structure in which they can offer service to the emperor, which was completely lacking during the reign of Sigismund. Um, Maximilian himself was very interested in promoting men purely on the basis of merit. He had no interest in just appointing nobles to the rank and he filled his court with um, humanists, but this is just in his own domain. This isn't something which um, spread throughout the rest of Europe. And uh, as we mentioned, you know, back with the chancery languages, uh, there are multiple centers of, um, you know, regality essentially in Germany. The other major center being the Saxon court at Meissen. So the emperor didn't have a monopoly on this, but he was essentially lead, a leading advocate for imperial reform. And as we can see, it establishes Habsburg and the, the preeminence of the emperor, but within the context of this incredibly fragmented, decentralized network. Um, I, I, I mean, <clears throat> I'd also uh, like to point out that Maximilian is quite instrumental in the rise of another uh, German noble house, the, uh, the Turnant Taxis, uh, uh, clan, um, because he makes uh, Franz von von Taxis the uh, the the post uh, the postmaster general mm. of the new uh, of the new postal system he opens, which I believe was the first modern postal system in the world. Um, is that is that where the word taxi comes from? I don't know. I, let me look into the etymology of that. Uh, <laughs> I wonder. I wonder. I also. Uh, I'm pretty sure yes. I remember that name. I remember that name from um, oh, what was that? I think there was a film, um, the Budapest Hotel or something. Um, I think they might have they get, they, they, that they, they, they get a yeah. reference in the yeah uh, yeah uh, they get, they call something similar. But um, I've actually met um, I I I uh, well I've met two uh, descendants of the uh, the Turn and uh, and Taxis family. Let's just say they're um, uh, not as noble as they once were. Um, <laughs> oh, Panama hat moving in, in high circles. Well, well, yes. Um, in in order to uh, well, that's, that's this is what comes of being related to minor minor nobility. Uh, but but it's um, uh, in in order to maintain their um wealth and and uh, an influence within Austria, which which they still are. They they still they still have an awful lot of uh, political and economic power within Austria. The turn of taxis. They've of course had had to become you know completely deracinated bourgeois uh money money pickers and you know bank operators and that sort of thing so um 
Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what's happened everywhere. I mean, all of the sort of, you know, old boy families that I know, I mean, they all work in finance. I mean, you know, yeah, that's just how things are now. But anyway, you, anyway. Either finance or, or, or government, um, or both. Um, no, but the origin of taxi is apparently uh, uh, tax amateur, because, of course, in a taxi, you you, you have the meter. So tax oh, amateur. Oh, of course. Hence, yes. you know, uh, cook from, yeah. from, from the Latin uh, taxa to charge. Uh, ah, and then that just got with taxi. Yeah. Unfortunately, no. It would be very good if uh, 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 that that was the etymology of it. But no. Yes, you could have mocked them with it. It would have been fun. <laughs> yes, there 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 is a um, an etymology, a famous etymology, which derives from a slightly earlier period, which is that um, the term wealth comes from the House of Wealth, um, which was the house of Henry the Lion against Frederick Barbarossa some hundred years before this. Oh, wow. um, Wonderful. So, just just to finish off on my point about the the imperial um, uh, circles, um, this wasn't universally accepted. So there were you know six imperial circles in fifteen hundred. By the end of um, Maximilian's reign, there were ten. However, the Swiss refused to pay the common penny. They wanted yeah. no part of the system from fourteen ninety nine onwards. And the effect of this was that the Swiss had already proven their military dominance over the Habsburgs, and it already proven their military dominance over the Burgundians. There was no will of the imperial princes or the emperor to invade Switzerland to impose the situation because the reason it worked so well was because Maximilian was playing off the you know the fears essentially of this of the estates who weren't so military power militarily powerful as the Swiss to create essentially the climate for imperial reform which Sigismund had tried and failed to do so desperately um of course the Swiss are the exception to that so basically from the 1500s onwards the Swiss are independent in all but name but their formal independence won't come until 1648 when among other failure. things the dutch the dutch will also be recognized as independent from the empire yeah. so this gets to uh the real crux of the matter what well, the habsburgs are most famous for which is the massive expansion of marriage policy so maximilian as i said was responsible for you know creating the environment in which all of this was possible some as a result of conscious strategy some as a result of luck some as a result of basically the incidental result of forming an alliance to deal with the you know increasing situation you know re revolving around France. So you know in 1494, uh, Philip the Handsome becomes the Duke of Burgundy in earnest. Now he's reached his um reached his majority, and two years later, um, Maximilian contrives a grand alliance with Castile. Uh, for people again to reference this, this is why the Habsburgs are so successful. The Habsburgs are not just forming marriage alliances and consolidating alliance based on this dynastic principle of succession. They are benefiting from the fact that Burgundy had already successfully ensured this policy on from Philip the from Philip the Bold until Philip the Good, and had already created a dynastic empire, which the Habsburgs then inherited in 1477. Likewise, in Spain, um, Spain was you know ruled over you know until recently by three kingdoms. One was the Kingdom of Aragon, one was the Kingdom of Castile, one was the Kingdom of Portugal, and invariably you know the the Kingdom of Portugal had been you know at war you know various Castilian civil wars due to the due to the incompetency and you know. The rights of succession of various kings that's neither here or there um what eventually happens in castile and aragon is that you have the marriage of isabella and ferdinand therefore you, thereby uniting um the kingdoms of castile and aragon for the first time and through their progeny we see the creation of a united spain however this is where the habsburgs come in so philip uh, Philip the Handsome of Burgundy marries Joanna of Castile, and Margaret, his sister, marries John, the Prince of Asturias, the heir of Ferdinand and Isabella. Now, for the Habsburgs, we see a series of very fortunate things, which results in the Habsburgs acquiring Spain. So, first of all, John, the Duke of Astur uh, the Prince of Asturias, dies. In 1498, uh, Joanna's um, older sister, Isabella of Portugal, dies. She, however, had produced a son. And had this son survived, Portugal and Castile and Aragon would have been united 80 years before we had the, um, the death of um, Sebasti uh, Sebastian and the death of the Cardinal King. Um, however, uh, Mi um, Prince Miguel dies in 1500. 
and in that same year, Charles V is born. So as a result of all of these convenient deaths for the Habsburgs, Joanna, who was never expected to be queen, is suddenly the heir of Isabella and Ferdinand. And in 1504, um, Isabella dies. Now, Philip, to be fair, Philip is a bit of a bastard here. <laughs> Um, Philip <laughs> understands this, and he understands that he is now going to become King of Castile, and when his um, father-in-law dies, he will become the King of Aragon. So he moves his court, you know, most of his Burgundian court, to Castile in order to have the Cortes there, basically their version of the parliament, um, swear fealty to him, basically as the heir apparent. Now, Joanna, I think it's m most modern um, historians will refer to as having some form of severe depression. One aspect of this severe depression, of course, was that Joanna was deeply in love with her husband and Philip did not care anything for his wife. Philip was indelicate. Philip would repeatedly commit affairs and do nothing to hide it. And at the same time, that worked in Philip's advantage because the more of a cad he was, the worse his wife's um, mental situation got, the more Philip could claim that he should rule on her behalf as disgusting as that sounds, but that is essentially what happened. He profited through his um, his constant infidelities to weaken the mental situation of Joanna. And so by 1504 to 1506, Ferdinand, um, the mother, sorry, the father of um, Joanna, is desperately trying to fight for the, um, the rights of his daughter. And instead of that, Philip simply arrives, declares, you know, to the Cortes that you know, Joanna is unfit to rule and Ferdinand is basically coerced into a pact where Philip is basically acknowledged as the actual king of Castile. And of course, then Ferdinand goes away. This is the uh, the Treaty of uh, Villafalle. Um, uh, Philip then goes away. He repudiates that agreement. And then conveniently, Philip dies. A lot of contemporaries believe that Philip was murdered by Ferdinand, even though it is very likely that, again, kind of like um, Ladislaus, that he actually died of um, a fever very conveniently. Um, but nevertheless, the damage had already been done. You know, Ferdinand was able to restore his influence over Castile. Philip was unable to, you know, make advantage of the fact that he would have become king of Spain. Nevertheless, you've already had the creation of the heirs. You already have the creation of Ch would-be Charles V and Ferdinand. So essentially, it's now a matter of waiting for those princes to reach their majority mm -hmm. and then we have I'll, I'll go into the the grand inheritance at the end just as as an anecdote but in terms of linking this back to maximilian's you know conception of a dynastic, dynastic policy you then have the other great aspect of foresight which is his um relationship with the kingdoms of bohemia and hungary um essentially you know i, I was talking to you earlier about the um the powerful Jigalion dynasty that had united all of these thrones in the East. Yeah, and was they a die out as well, don't they? Um, well, 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 again, well, again, I think it, to give Maximilian a bit more credit, Maximilian had actually been supporting the Teutonic Knights and Muscovy to try and undermine the power of what would later mm. become the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So he could force the Jigalion dynasty to the negotiating table and he could marry his daughter, um, Mary of Austria, to Louis II. And in turn, this is the um, the son of the the, the the son of Ladislaus. And in turn, the daughter of Ladislaus, who was the king of Bohemia and Hungary, would marry his daughter Anna to Ferdinand, the younger brother of um, later Charles V. So through this fir this first Congress of Vienna, you have created the dynastic situation that when. Louis II dies at the Battle of Mohash in 1526. The Habsburgs are the only dynasty who can claim Bohemia and Hungary. And this is where you see the beginning of the Habsburg monarchy. And it's conceived of through the First Congress of Vienna, albeit with a little bit of luck that has characterized all of the um, <laughs> things which I've discussed. <laughs> but um, as you can see, you know, we are laying down the groundwork for the, the grand inheritance of um, of Ferdinand and of Charles, essentially. And, you know, I'll, I'll show you at the end what, what that map results in. But there's last thing which we really need to discuss as it pertains to Maximilian, which is that Maximilian is, I'll just move to the next um, thing so I don't forget it. Um, Maximilian is the conscious successor of Philip the Good of Burgundy. As we discussed in our previous stream, Philip the Good of Burgundy was able to mold his ducal court in Dijon and in Bruges into basically the 
the center of style which will be imitated throughout all of Europe. Now, Maximilian, of course, is that direct um, link between the Burgundian dynasty and their legacy because, of course, he marries the granddaughter of Philip the Good and Mary. He is regent of Burgundy. He is surrounded in this, um, you know, basically the legacy of the grand court of, um, of the Burgundian rulers. And he imitates it, and you could say advances it even further, combining this with the legacy of, you know, Dua and uh, Gutenberg and the German Renaissance. And very consciously, he models himself on this idea of, um, perfect chivalry essentially so well, one of the works which... the, the 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 order of the golden fleece as well didn't you you, you said he yes revived of course that. Yeah. but well no he doesn't need to revive it because he inherits it it's his inheritance um mary of course will become you know the grand master of the golden fleece she will then pass it on to her son philip so philip will you know establish you know of course then we'll have the austrian branch and the spanish branches but um we have that legacy it, you know, Maximilian himself is not going to inherit that order, but his progeny will through Philip, through that marriage, through his wife. And looking back on, you know, how he conceived of his own rule as this, you know, exemplification of a knightly king, um, he personally, you know, um, aided in the work of this this epic poetry, these works of sort of pseudo autobiography. So we have the um, the Thoyadank, which was again a mystical retelling, a romantic retelling of his journey to go and marry Mary of Burgundy in 1477. Then you have the, the Freital, which is an illustrated book of all the tournaments that um, Maximilian participated in. Of course, this wasn't original. Um, good King René of Anjou had also produced something very similar to this. And of course, uh, another, you know, a, basically a retelling of the life and the relationship between Frederick III and Maximilian um, is told in the, the so-called White King. I've got a little image in here, which is part of the, the illustrated manuscript. And of course, you know, you can say his greatest legacy to the contribution of the arts is through his patronage of Dürer. And, you know, in terms of like, we're talking about the summit of um, you know, German Renaissance art. We have the colossal um, series of um, uh, of, um, of printed um, woodblocks on the, on the left-hand side, which is his triumphal arch, which is only one of a series of works, which also include the triumphal procession and the triumphal carriage, essentially. And this piece of work, I, I believe it's about three and a half meters um, tall. It was absolutely vast. And the effect of this was that um, this could actually be replicated. So it was replicated, and like the um, the grand tapestries of the Burgundian dynasty, it was the, the design of it essentially was that it could be replicated and it could be demonstrated and used as basically a prestige symbol mm. for it must royal have, vassals it must have been, of Maximilian. It must have been done in pieces, surely. Oh yes, as you can it's see, the only way it was yeah. done. It was done in many, many pieces, and it, again, this this absolute giant monolith and as you can see just the incredible amount of detail and of course Dewar wasn't just um you know an expert in utilizing the um the press he was also you know a, a talented painter and of course you know, going back to to the beginning I mean there there is also an aspect of Dewar which I want to mention on the image on the right here which is a little hint of narcissism because this is done <laughs> just a hint <laughs> this is this is done of course in the year of our lord 1500 and I think very consciously here he is styling himself on jesus christ um yes. i think that, that that is an interpretation did, which has been he, advanced he did, by others he did seem to have something of a bit of a, a self-obsession given the sheer number of uh, very flattering self-portraits he did of himself yeah. i think it, i think there might even be a painting that he did of himself where he's holding the globe you know so it's sort of like christ mm -hmm. pantocrator you know the sort of the, the, the you know christ all-powerful but um in, in terms of this um this sort of humanistic um, um, culture and this humanistic environment around uh, Maximilian's court. Um, I believe also, I mean, in a literary sense, earlier on I mentioned Erasmus. Um, um, Erasmus was tutor to Charles V, the young Charles V, and mm -hmm. he actually he actually had printed the um, um, the education of a Christian prince, which was dedicated to Charles V as well. So, and you also had the the um, the Ancaridion as well, the, the the handbook, the you know the handbook of a of a of a Christian knight or the handbook of the knight, and and these are all dedicated to the Habsburgs as well, and so you see that sort of um, um the combination of that humanism with those sort of ideals of chivalry coming in on the literary side of things as well.
Yes, and of course, Erasmus is demonstrating the um, the Flemish aspect of this because, of course, Philip of uh, Philip the Handsome and Charles's court would be principally based in Burgundy, and of course, the the court of Maximilian will first be moved to Innsbruck, and then it'll be based in Vienna. So you have two centres essentially of um, Habsburg patrimony, and of course, the centre of um, power thereafter will eventually move to Castile. Um, it's not just again you mentioned you know humanism. Well, of course, he was. Maximilian was a great patron of the University of Vienna, which in turn became, you know, one of the great centers of Renaissance humanism. Um, he supported what would later become the so-called Second Viennese School of Mathematics by supporting people such as um, uh, Staborius. And well, I think um, I think Albert III himself was a mathematician, and he also patronized the university. And so there's a sort of tradition in the family of attachment to these sorts of things, especially when it pertains to Vienna, sort of, you know, mark of pride. And that was directly emphasized as well. I mean, because in addition to all of this, you have this desire to create a specific literary and genealogical trace basically of glory to exalt the Habsburgs as the greatest dynasty that ever was essentially. And this is part of a conscious policy of Maximilian. Of course, we've already talked about the um, uh, the effect of architecture in Innsbruck. I mean, probably, you know, the limitations of Maximilian was that despite his relationship with the Fuga dynasty and the um, exploitation of mines in the Tyrol was that he never had enough money. Um, so it would be interesting to see had he had more resources at hand, what more sort of wonders he would have created. But the fascinating thing about this, it's not just that um, Dürer went away and um, was given carte blanche. Maximilian was actively involved in every stage of the, the creation of this myth making, essentially. So you can see on the one hand, there is this um, major creative outpouring in Maximilian, but there is also this conscious political attempt to glorify his dynasty. You know, one of the, you know, you can almost say the sad aspects of Maximilian was that he had a, um, a fall from a horse, I believe, in 1501. And thereafter, he took a much more um, uh, cautious policy as it as it came to you know foreign relations so one of his great failures of course was in the italian wars which we'll get to um get get to later and of course you know suffer from depression but nevertheless in spite of that um he was able to achieve this great a great legacy through culture and of course the the marriage legacy which of course completely changed the face of europe forever but just you know lasting point um, we also mentioned in our previous stream regarding burgundy that um we see the innovations of a new burgundian school of music well of course Maximilian also inherits that legacy and we see the beginning of you know the patronage basically of you know the Habsburg beginning of basically a school of basically ha the Habsburg choir so all of these things and of course going all the way back to the beginning of our stream um, the chancery languages all of these elements we're seeing the conscious attempt to create an imperial identity I mean you could almost say it is this is a cultural assault similar to that what we see with um philip of burgundy what was philip of burgundy trying to do he was trying to create a sense of burgundian identity as distinct from france as distinct from the empire in order to establish some form of national identity we can say that maximilian is trying to repeat the same thing here as it pertains to a restoration of this idea of what it means to be the holy roman emperor and um but, but, but not only that is explicitly attaching it to the habsburgs you know he's yes exactly to, yeah yeah. And, and, and you can it, say it, this... it reminds it reminds me in a way of sort of um uh sorry to interrupt like that. I hate I hate bloody microphones, but um it reminds me sort of um um of you know Augustus and the early Caesars. You know, I mean you have this intense, intense um um patronage of the arts, you know, Virgil and all of the poets, um and the painters and the sculptors. And there's that same there's that same idea of trying to inseparately sort of link imperial authority with this one family you know to the point where people couldn't imagine it otherwise um and in both cases it seems to have been very successful yes and the same thing of course happened with um louis the 14th um regarding the family in particular the conscious association of the house of habsburg is integral to this idea of imperial myth making because we have explained in excruciating detail over several streams how after the Hohenstaufen dynasty collapsed, you had total and utter anarchy in Germany for 250 years. And you had this great feud between these um, houses ari uh, arising out of the ashes of the, the collapse of the Hohenstaufen dynasty. And what we're basically seeing here is the mending of all those wounds. On the one hand, you have the 
uh, diplomatic offensive through the marriages, the consolidation of Habsburg domains proper. You have the imperial reforms to consolidate the empire in the face of foreign threats. Now you have the cultural offensive and you also have the cultural offensive combined with the idea of dynasty that to be Habsburg is to be the emperor. And in terms of like a the success of that policy, I don't think any other dynasty in history is probably as exalted as that of the Habsburg. So in terms of creating this myth, I would say he he succeeded and was only substantiated through um, the course of history over the next several centuries, which gets us to the last point, which will lead us on to our stream when we eventually cover the universal monarch, Charles V, which is just going over the, the chronology of inheritance, which corresponds to you know the last few years of the Emperor Maximilian. So in 1506, Charles inherits Burgundy, which you can see on this map. The Burgundy succession, uh, the little areas in um, in fact, this map is slightly incorrect because parts of this, such as Gelders and parts of Utrecht, uh, will not be part of the Habsburg patrony, but more or less it's correct. It also includes parts of the uh, the free county of Burgundy as well. Um, this, of course, is the Burgundian succession. In addition to that, um, in 1516, uh, Charles finally reaches his majority at the age of 16, and due to the mental incapacity of his mother, Joanna, he is made co-ruler, which really means he is the effective king of Castile. Uh, Joanna spends the rest of her life uh, living you know, in a tower, basically isolated, and often seeking consolation near the coffin of her dead husband, uh, Philip the Handsome. So a very tragic and disturbing end for, for horrible, Joanna. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, his grandfather dies, one of his grandfather dies, um, that being Ferdinand of Aragon. So the Kingdom of Aragon, which itself was a grand composite monarchy, including the counties of Barcelona, Valencia, Aragon, um, Sardinia, Sicily, Naples. Well, Aragon's, the, Aragon's the eastern red part here. As yes, the eastern the red part, part yeah. of Spain. Uh, these parts are all inherited by Charles as well in 1516. And finally, in 1519, Maximilian dies. And Charles, as his grandson, inherits Austria and the lands proper, which we referred to back on you know, an earlier image when talking about Rudolf IV. And you know, as a result of a couple of you know well placed bribes by the House of Fuga, I think there's a lot there's an, a lot of overplaced um, mention of whether France the first of France could have become the Holy Roman Emperor, and I think that's utterly nonsense based on everything that we've been talking about <laughs> regarding the um, the imperial fear of France and the attempt to create um, national institutions in opposition to France. But for some reason, the claim that Francis could have reasonably taken the Holy Roman Empire is given a lot of credence. I do not believe that deserves any credence. And Charles it seems, it was... Seems, seems a little absurd. By, by what mechanism? Uh, I don't, I don't by the know. college, by the by the electorate, by the electors. The electors basically being bribed by Francis to elect him over Charles. <laughs> it would have had to be a hefty bribe. <laughs> yes, exactly. And people often cite to this saying, you know, oh, oh the Fugas were, were enlisted basically to help with the election. Well, of course, every single election involved a bit of bribery to make things, uh, make, make sure that things um, pass along smoothly if anything yeah. just so, to get to, the to election make, make sure that it's fortified <laughs> yes <laughs> even even on the aristocratic level i just i just can just screw democratic s systems everywhere just just don't use them just have good old uh, single line succession you know yes but this is what the habsburgs achieve with one yeah. exception uh in the 18th century so yes charles is um elected king of the romans and there we have the creation of the empire. And of course, this map also um, does not include the, the grand patrimony of Ferdinand, which includes Bohemia and Hungary. So it gets even bigger than this map. Yeah. But I think that's but, but a good it's place to- um, size, is it? I mean, I mean, he is, I mean, what you have Spain, which of course is, you know, bring will begin to bring in all of this vast wealth from the new world. And then in addition, you have essentially some of the wealthiest areas in all of Europe. I mean, you have yeah. again the Netherlands. You have you have Flanders. You have Burgundy. It, it, it's it's truly a remarkable inheritance, you know. And, and I, it I blows away every everyone else on the continent. I didn't realize they held territory in Africa too. Oh yes, this is. I mean, it's provisional territory. The first. Um, African possession, you know, post really the Romans, um, uh, was Sueta in, which is now part of Spain in Morocco, which was a Portuguese possession. Yeah. And then, of course, they expanded into the Canary Islands and, of course, into Cape Verde mm. and, of course, along the west coast of Africa. So, along the west, and of yeah. course, the Portuguese Empire, of course, will eventually be inherited by the Habsburgs under Philip II of Spain as well. So, at some point, I mean, and also everyone seems to forget that technically. 
um, through marriage, the Habsburgs also ruled over England <laughs> during the reign of Mary at the same time. <laughs> so, well, um, yes, and yes. then things went downhill. To say we the we least. conveniently tend to not not remember the period in which uh, uh, Mary and Mary and Philip were married. I noticed uh, <laughs> in popular English history. Mm. Wonderful. So, unless either of you have anything to say, we can uh, move on to the super chats. I am. Um, um, I'm sorry. After you, Pala Mahat. Oh, well, I, I was just sort of um, amazed at the logistics of trying to rule this. I mean, I mean, did all of these places at the same time recognize Charles V as their emperor? I mean, you know, was like, how, in 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 you know, how on earth do you do you control uh, uh, something this this enormous? Well, essentially, this is, I mean, it's basically called a composite monarchy. These are not national entities in the way that we would conceive of, say, for example, as England as being a national entity. Mm -hmm. Even within, like, Aragon, for example, and the Netherlands. Um, the Netherlands is a, a patchwork, essentially, of all of these different uh, legal systems, all of these different polities, which are only held together in personal union by Charles V. What Charles V tries to do is establish some form of uniformity over some of his possessions. So towards the end of his reign, Charles will create something called the Pragmatic Sanction in the Netherlands, which basically transforms the Netherlands from this patchwork into a consolidated state called the 17 provinces. And this will be this attempt again to centralize the Netherlands will be one of the leading causes of the Dutch revolt. In yeah, I was going to um, say, there's, there's something that came up bite them back in the bomb. In the 1560s. Uh. But even, you know, just, just in terms of like how much of a patchwork this was, um, the Habsburgs did not successfully even consolidate their control of Spain throughout their 200 year rule over Spain. Um, only the Bourbons, when they would come in after the uh, Spanish War of Succession, when we have King Philip V, uh, would do something as so radical as to abolish the separate institutions of the Kingdom of Aragon. So you can really say that these are, these are kingdoms held in personal union. And as a result of that, they are afforded a huge amount of autonomy and the mm -hmm. local nobility have yeah. a huge amount of power. Instead, you know, we're talking about, you know, where, where did the king or the emperor derive most of his power? He would tend to have to focus on a single possession. So in the case of Philip II, virtually all of his um, manpower uh, came from the Kingdom of Castile, and he couldn't lean too much on his other kingdoms without basically alienating them. So it was a complicated situation, to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, the, the one final point that I was just going to make is um, you mentioned when uh, uh, Maximilian is trying to get the, the, uh, uh, the, the sort of magnates and the people of the empire to pay the penny. Um, um, when he called the conference, which I believe was in Worms, yes, yeah, um, I think the Swiss didn't even get, um, um, they weren't even mentioned in the sort of documentation in any of the proclamations, they were just sort of ignored, but um, they were still expected to sort of pay these taxes. And um, when the Swabian War came along, as you mentioned, um, Maximilian sort of tried to use this horror uh, of of the swiss and the sort of um the terrifying victories that the swiss had won over the past century um and fisher who i've who i've who i've been reading you know he has a small chapter on this period um he, he has a really funny uh, paragraph where he says that um the average englishman or nobleman in the holy roman empire um <laughs> I'm considered Swissman and um, um, considered the Swiss with much the same vitriol and hatred that the modern conservative views the Bolshevist Russian, <laughs> which I thought might have been maybe a bit of an overstatement, but really not very popular, the Swiss. <laughs> Wonderful. So we just get on super chat so just anyway oh, yeah, um, super th there's someone uh i have to apologize profusely to which is um zachary bolduk um because he sent a 10 canadian dollar super chat on our stream on the burgundians and because i didn't scroll down far enough i managed to miss it but it's an interesting question which i think pertains to the whole sort of topic the whole series of streams we're doing uh which is this um since charlemagne had a campaign in the iberian peninsula why is the kingdom of aragon not part of the nations of charlemagne okay when i try to conceive of a way of like talking about the histories of um you know france of germany and of Italy, um, they all shared the distinction of having been ruled over by Charlemagne and the and the House of um, basically the Empire of the Carolingians. However, um, the territory uh, corresponding to those states um, 
or the empire itself is not continuous with the territory of those states historically or even today. So what I've essentially done is when we have the Treaty of Verdun, we see the creation of West Francia, France, East Francia, Germany and Middle Francia. With the Treaty of Prum, we see the creation of Italy, we see the creation of uh, Burgundy, the Aralat, and Lotharingia, Lorraine. Um, to my mind, that was the simplest way of actually conceiving of the literal nations, which were the legacy of the Carolingian Empire, those five. Uh, when it comes to Catalonia in particular, uh, Catalonia was not a nation, Catalonia was a march of the West yeah. Frankish king of France. It was part of what was called the Hispanic March when the boundary of France, because of the um, conflicts with um, El Andalus, uh, was bordering at the River Ebro. And after, you know, uh, basically a long history of autonomy, because as we mentioned in our stream, Carolingian authority collapsed and was overtaken by Capetian authority. Um, what had been the Hispanic March became the County of Barcelona, and it broke off from France. So rather than it being a nation conceived of through these you know, Carolingian settlements, it was one of the first regions to break away. And you know, just to draw the attention to the confusion of this, when I talk about the Kingdom of Italy, uh, the Kingdom of Italy doesn't refer to all of Italy. The Kingdom of Italy in the Carolingian sense only refers to the northern part mm -hmm. and the donations of Pepin responding to the Papal States. So when I was including southern Italy into this, into this equation, I had to contextualize it within the Guelf and Ghibelline conflict because it's only through the House of Hohenstaufen that they replaced the de Hauteville dynasty in, um, in southern Italy. And then you can't talk about the empire, you can't talk about Italy, you can't talk about East Francia or Germany without talking about southern Italy as well. So that is when southern Italy, which had previously been you know, divided between the, um, the Moors and the Byzantines, Made, it makes it sort of um, glorious entrance into the story. But Catalonia, only now is Catalonia really sort of coming back into this question of the nations of Charlemagne, because now it is re-entering that patronage with the Holy Roman Emperor. So uh, hopefully that answers your question as to how I've conceived this, but um, it, it, it's complicated to say the least, <laughs> but yeah, we're yeah. trying to we're trying to keep it into like a um, a strict, you know, France, Germany, Italy, and the, Burg the Burgundy stream was an attempt to try and wrestle with the idea that there are medieval nations who have failed, namely Lotharingia yeah. and the Aralat, and that there was a almost very successful attempt to restore them under Charles the Bold, but that again was left on the ash heap of history, but not quite, because as we've explained in this stream, that those provinces, as you can see here, the Burgundian inheritance then becomes part of the Habsburg patrimony. And it's incredibly important for moving, you know, onwards historically. So again, hopefully that's a very sort of <laughs> a languorous way of trying to answer your question. <laughs> I mean, you are right though. I mean, Spain, Spain especially had a very distinct sort of history on its own. I mean, uh, you know, a very strong history of independence in many of the places along the march as well. I mean, you mentioned the Cortes, you know, the sort of, um, um, governing bodies, which have a very old history, you know, not a lot of people know about that. But um, mm. I think um, it was it was Prescott in his history on uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, obviously being an American, you know, uh, um, um, gushes effusely about you know the the, the ancient self government of Spain and how you know this this was the sole source of any good as representative government, freedom and liberty. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's not surprising, but um, it. you know. American historians can't conceive of uh, monarchy other than being a tyranny. So uh, yeah, they're just savage provincials. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I was actually um I was thinking earlier right before I, I joined the stream I was I was discussing something American with somebody. I I honestly wish the entire continental United States would just sink into the ocean at this point. I I know this is off topic. Sorry, I just on that point <laughs> no, just because no, they, they, they don't yeah. do anything. Well, even even history, they can't even do history. You know, yeah. I, I mean, he was quite an impressive man. I mean, he did go, he did go blind for about five years, William Prescott, and he had to, and he had to um, have all of the readings that he needed to do dictated to him. And then he just, re you know, he just regained his sight one day. He just woke yeah. up and he could see again. <laughs> it must have been, it must have been quite, quite a journey to say the least. So you know, Andrew Cooper for twenty pounds. Thank you very much, Andrew Cooper. Oh my! Another excellent stream, chaps. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andrew Cooper. Uh, yeah. Kolkia for <laughs> we have our own Jakob Fugger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Kolkia for five euros. Given we are talking about Sigismund, have you played Kingdom Come Deliverance? Highly recommended for the detailed history of Bohemia. No, I've never played Kingdom Come Deliverance. Um, anyone else? sort of Middle Ages game? I, I've not played it. One thing I was going to um, to bring up, though, when we were talking about um, Matthias Corvinus, and this is a little bit of a subject change, but um, I, I don't know if either of you are familiar with The Witcher. Yeah. I've yeah, had but all, the, the, all, well, all my the, friends nerd out about it to me constantly. Ah, well, good. But um, I remember um, um, you have the um, the, the Nilf Guardians, uh, and, and I, I always wondered to myself if um, the Black Army of Matthias Corvinus was sort of at least an aesthetic inspiration for the Nilf Guardians. I think that would be something to look into. Well, he pillages his way through Hungary. Well, that, but it's also a sort of the same sort of idea of a sort of professional army, a very mm. feared professional army, and they all dress in the black plate as well. You know, it is, it is odd to me that um, how uh, feared professional armies were, but but they always seem to be kind of um, like because normally whenever somebody comes up with a kind of uh, ground, a, a powerful military force. Everybody tries to ape it, but with these professional armies in this period, um, like people are very content to stick the sort of feudal levies until the next. Well, war a professional comes a professional army is a dangerous thing. You know, it, it can only mm -hmm. work if you if you can keep control of them. Essentially, um, you know, mm -hmm. it's m much more apt to fly off the handle. I mean, you see that happen. I mean, when um, Matthias Corvinus dies. Um, the remnants of the Black Army essentially go crazy, right? They end up getting yeah. into all sorts of mischief. They have to be disbanded because, I mean, the same thing, of course, in Rome. You know, I mean, the legions were a professional army, and if there's no emperor, if they're not getting their money, they go insane. Uh, but on the counter side, of course, they can reach heights of effectiveness that you know a levied army just can't. And so, it's, but you, uh, so you, you, know. you, you're essentially risking creating a kind of Praetorian guard. Um, Yes, if, essentially. If essentially, yeah. that's exactly what you're... I mean, you're risking creating the legions. You don't need to say yeah. the Praetorian Guard. You know, I mean, the legions did much of the uh, the dirty work themselves. Yeah. yeah. The English Loyalist for 999 US dollars. Thank you very much. 999, not $999. Uh, I was going to say, there we go. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> to the great me. stream, AM. Uh, don't be bothered when you go off on your history. It is very impressive how you know so much. Q, do you have any recommendations for books on the Holy Roman Empire? Well, in terms of like a, a, a gentle introduction by something you know, relatively <laughs> recent, a historian called Peter H. Wilson has recently released two overview books on the Holy Roman Empire, which I think uh, could be like a quick introduction to this. Of course, there are also infinite number of um, books on the Habsburgs, um, uh, which, which again are interesting. Like for example, I've just bought a book by um, Martin Rady for a brief introduction to the ha to the House of Habsburg, if that helps. Um, but again, in terms of like more depth, you'll have to be more specific on the um, on the period. But um, uh, Wilson is a good introduction to the broad sort of sweep history of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, thank my, you very much of, for that. One of my friends gave me a copy of um, the Radetzky March by Roth. Recently, what, what what do you make of that? Yeah. Oh, my brain, my my brain is gone. Um, <laughs> it's a sort uh, of fiction th fiction novel. Oh yes, think, yes, 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 yes. I, I remember we 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 talked about it. Yeah, on, we did um, on our previous stream, and then I mentioned to you afterwards I hadn't I hadn't read it. Then I actually found out and actually had I had two copies. This is the problem when I'm um, reading books. You 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 can credit my memory, but um, I have a wonderful. I, for everything I remember, um, there is ten times as much that I forget. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so terrible when you remember a fact, especially when you're writing a paper or something, and you know that it's the case, but you just can't for the life of you remember where you read it. You oh, don't source. get me started it's on nightmarish, that. Nightmarish, absolutely. I've nightmarish. been I've been working on a book of um, uh, anti-modern thinkers recently, and that has dogged me. That 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 phenomena of just it's you really you tough, know yeah. something for a fact, but there's just you you can't find the uh, the attribution. I remember I had like a sort of manic week um, in my last year of university when I was working on my dissertation, <laughs> but I, and I was in that exact situation. I, I went to the library. I was trawling through everything that I had. Um, that I knew that I had read, and I eventually I eventually found the point in question. But yeah. oh my word, you know, just take take thorough notes. That's my advice. If anyone's listening to this and you're in university. Please take thorough notes, especially on your on your last uh, submission. It'll save you so much bother. 
wonderful. Sorry, I've, I've completely lost my. I've, oh yes, here we are. Uh, John Boy for ten euros. Um, I was going to pitch Henry the Navigator, son of Philippa of Lancaster, into this timeline. Any connections uh, regarding that? I mean, no. I mean, Philippa of Lancaster. I believe she was the daughter of Edward the Third, and so there might be some sort of distant connection. And of course, you know. John of Gaunt, sorry, John of Gaunt, not Edward III, grandson of um, Edward III. So you can draw some sort of distant connection with the War of the Roses, which hopefully Columba and I will be doing at some time. But um, regarding this, I mean, there were a lot of Portuguese claimants and you know, to the to the throne of Castile. Um, but I, I haven't sort of read up on that recently enough to be able to really offer anything in depth. I'm sorry. It's sort of remarkable in a way that I've been able to um, keep track of everything and not make any, well, hopefully serious blunders. <laughs> like I said, if I had begun to talk about the um, succession situation in Burgundy, then, uh, sorry, in um, Bavaria, um, I'm sure everyone would have fallen asleep because it is just as irritating and complicated as that of Austria. <laughs> <laughs> Germans, once again, huh? Bloody mm. Germans. <laughs> There are so many princelings. Anyway, uh, James for five pounds. Thank you very much. Uh, could you do a stream on alternative traditional political systems? I personally think the constitution of Sparta is particularly interesting. Well, yes, that that could be quite interesting. That could be an um, idea for um for heterodox. I've got my copy of um Constitution of the Lacedaemonians. Um, that would that would be fun. Yes, that would. That 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 could be an <laughs> interesting ever, stream. Um, I mean, have you ever read about um Spartan marriage? Absolutely yes. bizarre. Yes. If yes. anyone's if anyone's interested, go and go and read about um, um Spartan marriage. <laughs> it's a good laugh. Wonderful. And um, Lady of Shalot has just popped in to say um, that Iron Duke is hosting a stream for True Trafalgar Day. So yes, everyone, please go off to there and um, check out his stream. I thought um, Semiagog was streaming, but um, he he doesn't. Sorry, not Semiagog. Bradlip um, is streaming, but he doesn't appear to be streaming. Um, so I Man might have been history. horribly confused. Um, all, all I can say is, um, sorry that Marcus um, uh, wasn't here. I mean, I, I don't know what happened to him. Hopefully, hopefully he's all right. I think. I mean, um, I think. I think he, he might have made the same mistake as me because we 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 both assumed um, um, nine o'clock as always, but I, I misread. You know, uh, the tragedy. Oh, the tragedy of rescheduling. Oh well. Um, sorry, John Gordon is saying I left a tip or a question on Subscribestar. Um, I'll go and check that out, but I don't tend to leave. Um, I'm not sure quite how tipping works. So if you leave a super chat, I'll read it out here. But um, yes, if you leave me a tip on Subscribestar, I'll go over there and read it and respond to you. But um, I don't like I, I, I don't know how that works regarding Subscribestar questions. I just sort of answer YouTube super chats. But I will Fund, check that funds out. Funds the posse bank. And fill fill the coffers so that we can begin. Fill, uh, fill the coffers. Yes, yeah. we need to buy the castle. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, the the, um, the Castello solution, which um, Marcus is working on at the moment. For all of us. <laughs> the Schloss, the Schloss Patzer, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Cast wonderful. Off. So when I when Fast I find the time, <laughs> uh, so when I find the time, John Gordon, I'll um, I'll go and have a look at your um your question subscribe stuff. Anyway, um, does anyone have anything they want to show? Um, I have a couple Certainly of, um, I have a couple of essays in the work. Um, um, you know, I have this one on Arthur. I have one on Castiglione's courtier. Um, it's just been very, very busy at home, but I am planning on getting them out, um, sometime soon. So keep a little eye on that if you're interested in obscure Renaissance works. <laughs> Emma? Uh, no, no, nothing to show. Um, check out my channel for more, more videos, uh, maybe soon. Um, uh, I will put some things out on Kindle Books in a while. Uh, he's but too, I will, he's I will... too busy. He's too busy going to fancy dinners with the sons of the aristocracy. <laughs> oh yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yes, no, no I, I, this was this was this was uh, some years ago. The meeting with the eternal taxis, uh, <laughs> degenerates. Uh, but yes, we're uh, <clears throat> yes. I'll 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 put out information when it when it comes. Now, now, John Gordon, um, I have managed to to find your. Cause I've never done this before, so do bear with me. Uh, your your tip. I, I didn't even realise that was possible, but you've you've managed somehow. So thank you very much, John Gordon. Uh, I'll read it out here. Um, how might a unified Bavaria have affected the politics of the Holy Roman Empire? Could there have been a serious contender for the emperorship? Could they have stopped a Habsburg consolidation of power? Yeah, I mean. During the 14th century, 
the most effective of all the Holy Roman Emperors was Louis IV of the Bavarian, who aggressively pursued the sort of policies we're doing, albeit with far less sort of overall tangible success. After he died, the Wittelsbach dynasty imploded and they were not able to reconsolidate as successfully as the Habsburgs. They eventually did reconsolidate um, towards the end of the 15th century under the Dukes of, um, of Munich, and Munich will become established as the uh, the center of Bavaria, because of course you have many, you know, Ingolstadt, Landschut, um, Regensburg, many individual centers of Bavaria, but also the Bavarian house was split between the Palatinate branches and the uh, the imperial branch in Bavaria, the legacy of um, Louis IV. Um, the, the fascinating thing about the House of Wittelsbach is that um, they go down two very different historical routes. The Palatinate, which held the electoral seat, converts to uh, they convert they become part of the reformation and actively promote the reformation whereas the bavarian branch becomes stalwartly catholic under maximilian so much so that they are offered the um electorship in lieu of um in lieu of the of the elector of the palatinate and the bavarians do manage at one point to um usurp the Habsburgs. Um, during the Austrian War of Succession, uh, where Mary Theresa is left in that untenable position by her incompetent father, Charles VI, um, the Wittelsbach um, place, oh, my memory serves me correct, um, I, I, can't, I won't be able to remember the name, but um, you get what I mean, a Wittelsbach emperor on the imperial throne, and they rule for three years. So it, it did happen, and I think, um, during the 17th and 18th century, the early 17th and 18th century, Bavaria was the greatest threat to the House of Habsburg until the rise of Prussia under Frederick II. And after Frederick II, Bavaria almost becomes like a second-rate consideration. I mean, they make some sort of um, glorious you know, return by allying themselves with Napoleon under Maximilian Joseph against the, um, against the Habsburgs. And as a result of that, you have this massively expanded Bavaria into the 19th century, which includes Franconia and which includes Swabia, as well as the heartland of traditional Bavaria. I think you can say that the the irony, the ultimate irony of history is that you know, if Bavaria were an independent country, um, Bavaria would be richer and potentially more powerful than what is left of Austria. If that yeah. is, you know, some sort of um, impression of the actual legacy of the Wittelsbach versus do you think, um, um, the Habsburgs. Do you think, do you think hey, I'm just expanding on this? Because I feel like we've covered quite well here how, you know, the, 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 the humanism, but also the, you know, the craft traditions um, of great cities like Augsburg. Um, and these things in some ways sort of followed political power and, and, and followed the money and, and followed prestige, which is natural, of course. Artisans want to work for the emperors, the kings, the princes. Um, do you think, because you mentioned that Munich, you know, wasn't wasn't really on the same level as, as Augsburg or Nuremberg, do you think part of that was because of the fall of the Wittelsbach and the, and the fact that Bavaria was so divided and it, it wasn't very wealthy relative to the other the other centers and so it didn't have that same that same sort of accumulation of wealth and and technique and, and technical skill because of that that political situation do you think there might be something in that because if so then that has some implications for you know the history of Bavaria up to our own day well the, 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 there is a very obvious reason for that which is that um the Habsburgs, even after the temporary division we're talking about, the capital of Austria was always considered to be Vienna. Vienna was the obvious political center all the way back, you know, um, to, really since the Babenburger time, even before the Habsburgs. Uh, with the Wittelsbach, however, um, the traditional capital of Bavaria wasn't Munich at all, it was Regensburg. And after you know you have the collapse of authority in bavaria you have all of these little local centers trying to replace regensburg as the obvious capital of the region essentially like i mentioned landschut and um ingolstadt um so what the reason munich finally rises to preeminence it becomes the capital of bavaria i think around just after 1500 um is that this is a particular branch of the wittelsbach having united the rest of Bavaria and therefore consolidating under a new capital. And Munich will be this wonderful center of 
Italian Renaissance human, humanism within Germany. If you go to Munich, there is, it's almost like going around um, Florence. There is a very distinct impression left by the Italian Renaissance on Munich itself, especially the Munich residents. And thereafter, Munich will become one of the great cultural centers of Germany moving forward. However, Vienna and Prague and the other cities in the empire had the head start on Munich by several hundred years. Yeah, and Munich never, I mean, Bavaria generally never reaches the same level of, you know, industrialization and the industrial centers are elsewhere. And there are other reasons as well, you know, availability of resources. But I mean, that has a huge implications for the religious makeup, the uh, the political situation, which we've covered very well in the Politea series. So <laughs> a quick shill for that, I suppose. Wonderful. So thank you very much, Columba. And thank you, Panama Hat, for being such a wonderful last minute substitution. And thank you for no coming worries. on such um such well, well even late notice so it was uh, it was past the time when i invited you on um so thank you very much um thank you to my wonderful patron sister here if you have any interest in contributing to the channel um there is a link in the description thank you all very much for watching and good night thank you Bye, oh and please leave a like and comment and do check in on monday's stream when we're just going to like the, button. Yes, the, yes tell your friends <laughs> the Italian Wars on Monday, we're going to be discussing all the diabolical popes. It's going to be very saucy, so come back then. Mm. If anyone has an interest in the Borgias, we'll be discussing them. <laughs>